Well, well, well. You all thought I was crazy. Just remember, when it snows at 9.08 a.m., Monday, January the 8th, 2024, in Vancouver, British Columbia, remember who bought a snow shovel and de-icing salt from Canadian Tire in the second week of August. Ooh. <laughs> oh, baby. When you see all the hosers trying to shovel their sidewalks with a broom, oh, they will get on their knees and beg for me to help. Well, I don't actually, I didn't smugly offer to help them. Um, partly because my neighbors, I believe, still have not returned to their domicile since October. And partly because it's snowing only in the literal sense. Uh, it, is, it is light flurries that I do not believe will stick to the ground. But then like on, let me see, I, mean, I hate to open with the weather here because I know Apollo's the weather guy. But apparently it's getting kind of crazy here by Vancouver standards. Hang on, I'm going to allow ads on the weathernetwork.com. Let me, let me see here, okay? It's barely supposed to get a little crazy. Thursday, a few flurries. Whoa, that's rough. 24-hour um, snow, tilde one centimeter. What does tilde mean? Zero centimeters, I guess. Tem low temperature of minus 10, though. Holy. Okay, we're not... I don't need the shovel. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> it turns out I do not need the shovel. Um, what about in the next 14 days? Two to four centimeters one day, possibly. I doubt it. I doubt it. Well, one day that shovel is going to be useful. I mean, it was only like 19 bucks or something like that anyway. Let's start with some Vandal. 1987 with 55 million views. I don't know it immediately. Let me get an electric guitar on this. Yeah. Give me piano, please. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Heaven is a Place on Earth by Belinda Carlisle. Yeah, dude, this is a Peloton classic. This is played in every Sam Yo 80s ride. Something, something, you know what it's worth. They say that heaven is a place on earth. guys had it wrong at the same time why not because this sounds like bon jovi especially with the, with the piano it, it it's like a it's living on a prayer but in a different key i can't i can't get it to line up but it is It does not work. <laughs> it does sound like some Bon Jovi ass detritus, though. But instead, it's actually a half decent song. I, that's my favorite Bon Jovi trope: is when they bring out the talk box. We're back and playing Isaac. Can I say, by the way, I for the last. Um, Week while riding the bike, I have eschewed Peloton classes and instead uh, been watching some movies. I gotta say, I'm not going to bat for the Disney Corporation, but it turns out 20th Century Fox has some damn heaters, man, in their catalog. When they got acquired by the, uh, the Disney Corporation and all their stuff got rolled up into Disney Plus or maybe Hulu in, in the United States of America. 
There's some heaters on there, man. You know what I what I watched over the last two days? I finished it today. I watched Ridley Scott's 2021 film, uh, The Last Duel, where Matt Damon has a mullet and a goatee, and Ben Affleck has a bowl cut and a goatee, and that's a that's a 101 mile an hour fastball. I apologize because I had previously said. Ridley Scott is not washed, but when he started talking his smack about uh, Marvel movies, I was like, Ridley, when I want my opinion on uh, what color milk an android should bleed in outer space, spoilers, the android's not the bad guy. Double spoilers, we faked you out. He's always the bad guy. Anyway, I, I was like, you should stay in your lane a little bit, Ridley. A little bit? I watched, in the last week, I watched The Martian. Pretty good, enjoyable, certainly. I, th I think I would call that a three and a half out of five. Kingdom of Heaven, they didn't have the director's cut, so I apologize. Kingdom of Heaven theatrical cut, decent movie, Sword and Sandal. I gave it a three out of five, still liked it. What a cast, too. Michael Sheen, um, Liam Neeson, uh, the, 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 David Thewlis. I mean, that's we're not even talking about the, uh, the, the top build actors necessarily. The Last Duel, that's a four and a half star out of five Andy, as far as I'm concerned. That is, uh, I enjoyed my time with that movie immensely. 3.5 out of five is a lazy score. Um, you're everything wrong with the state of user reviews, just so you know. Not every review needs to change the world. Not every piece of art warrants that. Some pieces of art warrants a, uh, a 3.5 out of five. I watched the creator in theaters. I gave it a four out of 10. I, I'm thinking you're based, John Wick voice. I'm thinking you're based. Um, Cause I gave it a two out of five, which is, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not that good with fractions. I think that becomes a four out of 10. What, what else has Gareth Edwards done? Cause I know his name, but I can't recall where um, I know it from. Oh, he did Rogue One. That's right, Rogue One. And the Godzilla, oh, Godzilla like 2014. All right, I'm not saying he's washed. I'm just saying he's, what has he done for me lately? No dis, I mean, well, like it's, I don't mean to incite personal attacks on the man. I'm just, it, it wasn't my cup of tea. Anyway, that's all I got. Cause I saw someone say, did you also watch Master and Commander this weekend? Wait, because you, you derived that all from my tweet about um, Stanley Cups, January, 2024. Stanley rules America. The Thermos fleet is the only thing that stands between it and world domination. Cups are now battlefields. So is the letterbox account real? I say this with all due respect. Many of you need to leave your house and go outside. Because <laughs> I logged into my old letterbox account. I'm being sincere, by the way. I laughed, but it's because it's funny to me. It should not be funny to you. It should be troubling. Um, I logged into my old Letterboxd account to like log the movies that I've seen on the bike so that I can keep them straight and remember what I thought about them. And then literally, so I logged like four movies that I watched last week. Then I went to bed and I woke up to like 90 emails that were like X person just followed you on Letterboxd. X person just followed you on Letterboxd. And I'm like, so obviously I don't know if there was a tweet or a, um, uh, a subreddit post or something like that. I'm very flattered that you care to log in every day and see what score I gave to a movie with no review attached to it whatsoever. I will not be writing my thoughts on the movies. I will simply be putting my score there. The fact that it's not that deep is kind of, I mean, you got to understand. This is something I, I, I did with no fanfare whatsoever at like, you know, 10.43 p.m. on Saturday night. And I was like, let's just get, you know, just so I have a ledger for myself. And then I, uh, I wasn't surprised, by the way, but I woke up and I, when I saw all the email replies, I was like, okay, I forgot what business I'm in. I, you know, it makes me have a lot of sympathy for Taylor Swift. This level of like uh, popularity where you can't help but have like a national media event just for existing. 
It's like Taylor Swift stuns in essential sweatshirt en route to Trader Joe's. It's like, bro, she's literally buying her groceries right now. She's getting the sweet and sour chicken jalapeno poppers. Like, this is not uh, like a concert. She's just chilling. I've been trying to cook up a joke about President's Choice. It just sucks. I, I've been burdened with being born in Canada. So people don't know what President's Choice is. Um, unless they live here. But, like, of course that shit's the President's Choice. He's the only motherfucker that can afford it. Right? Am I right, people? Am I right? Corey, am I right? Am I right? Plus two, plus two, plus two. Plus. It's probably like the 9,000th person to make that joke. <laughs> White cheddar PC mac and cheese goes crazy. I don't know what to tell you, okay? I'm just saying, it's expensive. I have some respect for the products at President's Choice. I actually, I went to a President's Choice grocery store. Very rare. There's not that many in Vancouver. In the Vancouver area, I guess, there's like real Canadian superstores and stuff like that. Inside of the city proper, there ain't too many. There's mostly no frills if we're talking about PC brand. And I was like, this shit is too expensive. But then I went to the deli and I got some ham. And the dude, it was like going to a grocery store, I can only imagine, in like 1981. The dude was like, hello, sir, what can I get for you today? And I said, thank you, my good man. Can I have 300 grams of your country ham? And he said, it would be my pleasure. And then he sliced it in, he said, what kind of slices would you like? A question that would have very much intimidated me, um, you know, as a younger man. I would have been like, I didn't rehearse this one before I came out. I said, it's for sandwiches, so whatever you think is best. He nodded and said, very good, sir. Sliced it up. I looked me in the eye said have a nice day. I said the same thing to him. Have a nice day You too you as well Had a sandwich with it last night. It's the most lovingly cut deli meat. I've ever had in my entire life It's like Goodfellas like he sliced the ham with a razor blade It's so thin like you can see your hand through it when you take it out of the package This man is a hero President's choice or Costco. This is this is PC bro. I love Costco as much as the next guy probably more than the next guy based on what I've seen in chat at least. You're not getting anything at the Costco deli counter. That stuff was shipped in by a truck. Do you ever been to an urban fair? Brother, I went to urban fair. I thought to myself, you know what? I got, this is too expensive for me. I gotta go to suburban fair. <laughs> so suburban fair is uh, an offshoot of the Savon brand. So my joke when I go there is, uh, hey, do you wanna, well, there, there's a, an urban fair close. We can go there. We can drive a little bit. We can go to a save on foods or we can stay here and go to a spend on foods. That joke kills in the lower mainland, bro. Corey, back me up. Listen, I kind of botched the delivery. It is 9.27 a.m. On a, on a Monday morning. I'm working on it. <laughs> still, <laughs> heart rate's still a little elevated from the last duel. I don't get it. They, the company that owns Urban Fair owns a grocery store called Save On Foods. But Urban Fair is like their uh, upscale grocery store, which means they sell exactly the same products, but 30 to 100% more expensive. So you call it Spend On Foods. Best joke I've ever heard at 9.28 on a Monday morning. People make fun of it, but like no joke hits like a bad manager's joke at 9.28 on a Monday morning. Working hard or hardly working, on, a, on an extremely cold day, your boss saying, hot enough for you? Oh, man. <laughs> it hits different. Catch my ass cracking up, I know. Being a class trader, cracking up at my manager's joke. He's crushed by the same boot as the rest of us, I imagine. Having fun used to be my boss's favorite. You know what was annoying um, when I used to work in a, in a more traditional office environment? When you are um, a lackey and you're pissing and then your boss comes in. But maybe then I like he wants to pee alongside of you as if he's like one of you. But he mostly just golfs like all day. And you're like, brother, we can't talk about our weekend plans. Like I was in my second year of university. What do you think I'm going to do this weekend, bro? It's Friday. I'm going to stay up until like 4.33 a.m. Pass out. Wake up at like 11 a.m. Go out for brunch. Repeat the process. And then Sunday night, I'm going to be like, yeah, I don't know. I think I have like genetic predisposition to insomnia. I just can't. I, I have a, about once a week. I have like a really hard time getting to sleep. 
Your ass has like four kids. Like we, what, what kind of like camaraderie are we gonna find? Maybe that was naive of me. Maybe he felt the same way when he came in. He just had to go piss and then he comes in and he's like, oh, there's this college kid in here. I can't just like go into a stall that's emasculating and I'm the manager here. I've got to project power. That's why I practice my handshake in the mirror six hours a day. You can just not talk. You don't get it. You don't understand. You're not cut out for this world. Urinal talk is goaded. That's how I know DL Guiga is going to make it. DL Guiga, you, did you ever think about that? You're cut from an, an earlier time. I mean that um, non-derogatorily. Millennials and, uh, and Gen Z are going to kill urinal talk. And I'm going to be, I mean, I don't really mind urinal talk, but that's because I just go to a stall no matter what. <laughs> Motherfuckers found my letterbox account after I gave a four-star review of Master and Commander. I can't afford to be pulling my cock out in a public bathroom. You know, this shit will end up on the subreddit and like, before I even zip up. Just realized how many fucking Matt Damon movies I've been watching, man. If you had asked me um, a week ago I, how I felt about Matt Damon, I would have said, like, he's a really good actor. After the last week of, of Matt Damon movies, I'm like, he's a living treasure, bro. He's the hate crime guy? No, that's Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> no allegedly required. But put some respect on Matt Damon's name. Just because he's from Boston doesn't mean he's, he's committed a hate crime. <laughs> That's just Mark Wahlberg and then, like, some other guys, I'm sure, but I don't know. We, we've never heard that about Matt Damon. Wahlberg's from Boston? Bro, are you kidding me? He's from Boston in, like, every movie he's ever done. He's the most Boston guy of all time. Except the one where he's from Mars. Brother, listen. I'm not talking about Matt Damon. You need to see The Martian, because in The Martian, that motherfucker is not from Mars, okay? He's from Earth, the same way all of us are. You know what's crazy? You know in The Martian, which came out in like 2015, when he says that um, according to his uh, professor, if you can grow plants somewhere, you've officially colonized it, and then he says, I've colonized Mars. That got a standing ovation in the theater in 2015. You think it would have people leaving the theater in 2024 if the movie had come out now? <laughs> Dave Chappelle ass joke. <laughs> not, not yet, not quite. <laughs> it's okay because he's from Mars. Listen, I know that that's misinformation, but I'm going to allow it because it gets me out of a jam. It's okay. He was the first dude there. Excuse me. He's not the first dude there. A third of the way through the movie, he uh, unearths the Pathfinder rover. That dude's been chilling there since like, I don't know, 1998 or something like that. Robots aren't people. Wow, okay, somebody needs to see the creator, bro. Even if it is a two out of five, it has a lot that it could teach us. He's also on Ares 4. There were three other Ares missions before him. Um, okay, first off, CEO of the Martian is in chat. Secondly, you don't know, those all could have blown up in the atmosphere. Maybe Ares 4 is the first one that actually made it. Kind of like how Apollo 13 is the first one to the moon. Listen, we got a lot of problems here in chat. There's a lot of teenagers watching this that may like hear this and they have no choice but to absorb it. We as adults, we have no choice but to forget it, which means we can tell jokes more flippantly. Because even if someone tells us a lie, we won't remember it in like two weeks. But if you're like 14 and you're watching this, you might end up embarrassing yourself at Knowledge Bowl and being like, yeah, Apollo 13 was the first one to land on the moon. And they're going to be like, brother, you should watch the movie. It's very simple. Just to clear things up, none of the Apollo missions landed on the moon, okay? They're trying to trick you. Not NASA, but okay, but Chad mostly I'm referring to here. Okay, slash marker me. For the YouTube Andes, I believe the moon landing actually happened. I'm not, I don't want to, normally I would slash marker that, but I'm a coward. I don't want to leave you for 24 hours thinking that I believe that the moon landing is fake. But why is the flag flapping in the wind? Or I don't even know if I've ever seen the original footage. I've only seen it in like alien invasion movies where like it starts with them landing on the moon and then they see like the shadow of a spaceship coming over the, the earth and then it's like, dung dung, Michael Bay presents. Watch any westerns? What did, they're not coming back 
boys. I'm sorry. I for some reason I don't I I thought it was one person. Apparently there's a lot of people in the chat that are they leave a light on for the westerns. I like some westerns. I like the good, the bad and the ugly. But anytime you're like, "Hey, you should watch like this 1961 movie with John Wayne." I'm like, it's simply not going to happen. As an older guy, was Ridley Scott always like this? Bro, Ridley Scott is like 86 years old. I'm 35. <laughs> what do you mean was he always like this? Alien came out when I was negative nine, bro. I don't know. Ridley Scott only started to exist for me when Gladiator came out. That's why I'm going into the back catalog. Is Ridley Scott, what, a, what an ignorant question. Has Ridley Scott always been like this? What do you mean like this? I do like that Ridley Scott only makes like two kinds of movies though. And I think, you know, some directors are like one for them, one for me. Like one box office uh, hit and then one passion project. I really feel like Ridley Scott does one for him and then one for him. But the two different hymns, one of them is like, I love um, slightly, well, maybe more than slightly exaggerated historical epics. And then the other one is like, I promise it's not an alien movie. And then it's an alien movie. And he just keeps going back and forth. What about Blade Runner? He only did one of those, though. The second one, I don't know. He was he was too busy making uh, Alien Covenant. Couldn't find time in his schedule. House of Gucci? That's true. I, he has a third kind of movie, which is like uh, ensemble pictures. American Gangster. House of Gucci. The man has a, a, a prolific work ethic. Who has a more precipitous drop-off, Ridley or Tim Burton? Bro, is this who, coughing baby versus hydrogen bomb? Are you kidding me? Tim Burton, bro. Tim Burton. Ridley Scott's still putting, not every movie's a banger, but he's still putting out, like, fastballs at least. I don't even know. Tim Burton's just throwing depth balls nonstop. What about Frank and Weenie? This shit came out in, like, 2009, bro. You're living in the past. Ridley Scott's made like 14 movies since Frank and Weenie came out. Sweeney Todd? That shit came out in 2006 or something. Who's living in the past now, bro? Ridley Scott came out with The Last Duel not but two years ago. He came out with The Martian in 2015. I, I mean, the man is also in his fucking 80s, bro. Do you understand that? There's not that many, like, <laughs> artists in any medium out there that still have, like, a 60% a hit rate into their 80s, man. Yeah, think about what Tim Burton has done, like, post-Big Fish, man. I mean, I, I, I loved Tim Burton when I was younger. I've probably seen, I don't know, like, seven Tim Burton movies in theaters, which is frightening to think about. He did Charlie and the, Ch or, yeah, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory 05. And then, like, nine movies where Johnny Depp banged his wife. He's done, like, so much shit that I, I can't even remember. You can remember Dark Shadows? Dark Shadows was dog? Of course it was dog. <laughs> it has Johnny Depp in it, like... I'm sorry! I Like, irrespective of where Johnny Depp is at now... I mean, Johnny Depp and Tim Burton, they went down together. He did live action Dumbo 2019. That's what I'm talking about. Like, I don't know what happened to Tim Burton. I respect the fact that, you know, he put out some slappers. He defined the goth archetype for a new generation. The first two Batmans are, are good movies. Nightmare Before Christmas. Apparently Frank and Weenie as well. At some point, maybe you it's the, the curse of, you know, being an artist. You run out of ideas, but you still got to work. Like, you got bills to pay. <laughs> yeah, it's when your goat is washed. It's like watching me play Isaac now. I'm like, not a, you're like, why the hell is he playing Isaac? Well, you, the, the rent's due, bro. Still, you can see shadows of, like, the, of the older self. But, I mean, we're not getting Ed Wood, too. And if we did, it wouldn't be what I, I would want it to be. Shit would be like straight to crackle or something. For real, they're doing Beetlejuice too. It's <laughs> what did Elon say? <laughs> that horrible tweet. It was like um, 
pretty soon they're just going to come out with the sequel first. One one of the rare times that he's he's actually cooked. He did tweet Nerve as well. I saw that. Tell me you watch Neon Genesis Evangelion without telling me you watch Neon Genesis Evangelion. I just realized I, I have more in common with Ridley Scott than I thought. We're both working well into our old age doing what we love. Not every picture is a, is a slapper, but they're, they're all worth watching in their own way. There's no shot. You're on 15 second delay? That's like Dan's internet speed. I was losing it. I don't. I never know when Dan is is asking an honest question. So Dan said he was moving. I was in his chat for like ten minutes this morning. He said he's moving, and he said I need your opinion on this. I can get consumer internet for like fifty bucks a month or something, or I can pay four hundred bucks a month and get a dedicated business fiber line. And I said, okay, what is the business fiber line speed? And he said it's twenty megabits up and down, which is obviously dog. So I said, well, the price versus the service is like horrible. But if it's your only option for reliable internet and you're a streamer, then you got to do what you got to do. And then I thought about it for a second and I said like, wait, what's the consumer speed? And he said, it's 500 up, 100 down. And I was like, bro, go with the consumer internet. What's wrong with you? That's not even like a, a, a sensible question. That's like, should I eat a hamburger or like cyanide? I didn't under, I, at first I thought it was like, oh, the consumer internet will be even worse. So like, even though the 400 bucks a month is expensive, like it might be my only way to get reliable internet. It turns out it's just, I think he just likes the idea of him being the only person on his internet line. <laughs> it's like nobody, he kept saying like, nobody else is going to be clogging my pipes. Then he was like, are you on business? Or he said, are you on consumer internet? And I said, yes. And then like a second later, he was like, oh, so you're on business? And everyone in chat was like, no, he said yes to is he on consumer? And then he said, OK, I'm confused. Is he on consumer or business? And I was just like, what are we doing here? So I just typed. I know Dan is family friendly, so I wanted to type we go on Rashomon in this bitch. But instead, I just typed we go on Rashomon in this. Then it turned into like it was like a nationalism d debate. He, people were like, why is your internet so good? And I'm like, because I live in a city. And people were like, oh, I bet Canadian internet's better than American internet. And then people were like, no shot, bro. Canada's like a frozen wasteland. And they're like, not in the cities, bro. And I'm like, what are we doing? I, just, I was just answering the man's question. And now all of a sudden, we're doing like the War of 1812 LARPing all over again. It was crazy, man. Yeah, I started a, a damn continental war. Don't Canadian ISPs still do data caps? We still pay by the, the minute up here, man. This is a labor of love. We don't pay by the minute. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, come on. You believe that? Hey, we, guys, we just elected a new prime minister. His name is Jean Poutine. Congratulations, Canadians, on the election of your new prime minister, Jean Poutine. Congratulations, Canada, on getting the first igloo wired up with electricity. Okay, so I've seen you type in chat many times. NL, do I have your consent to build a large language model based on your voice, training it on the transcripts of your videos? No, you don't. Um, and then the last message you said is, because someone in chat said, are you joking? And you said, I'm not joking. I would love to get consent from the man directly. You don't have it. I'm not, it's not a personal attack. I'm not mad at you. But the, I would like to acknowledge that I also cannot stop you. But you do not have my assent to it. Plus two for asking? Well, no, not if they're going to make it anyway. That's a minus two. <laughs> but I acknowledge it's not like I could do anything about it. So, And it's probably already been done um, many times. That being said... The soul belongs to the man, okay? No matter what pieces deign to move it. So it's real. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it in your hands. Are we watching AI NL right now? Absolutely not, because I uh, make sense, and I'm saying things that are interesting and occasionally also make people laugh. 
It is a plus two for asking. Okay, you know what? I'm going to take it back. I'm going to say plus two for asking that you've given me more um, consideration than Mid Journey did, at least. Let me go. You go to Mid Journey. Bald Canadian streamer playing independent roguelite video game. Tell me my ass doesn't pop up. Do not type glasses into the, into the prompt and see if it gives me glasses. That's how you know we're cooked, boys. Hey, spiders, kill this guy. Mods, put Lego all over his floor. Can I tell you something embarrassing? Um, I have uh, foot pain that I'm sure comes from my, to put it politely, my unique gait. I haven't seen a podiatrist yet, but I've, I've self-diagnosed myself online as having a condition called Monroe's Neuralgia, which basically feels like after walking too much in my socks, it feels like there's a marble in my foot. So when I step on it, it's a little ouchy. It, stay, it starts to feel like a grain of sand, but after a long day, it's, like a, it's more like a marble. Um, so I said, you know what? I'm going to go get slippers because it seems like it gets aggravated by walking around in because our house is hardwood and tile and stuff so I, I it gets aggravated by walking around on that i went to the pharmacy to buy slippers i walk well the drugstore i walk inside of the drugstore wall-to-wall -wall slipper section i'm in the slipper district okay i look through every single pair of slippers that they have not a single pair of men's slippers. And there's literally, I would say there's 50 to 100 pairs of slippers inside of the pharmacy. Women's, 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 women's. I went to all the end caps, women's, 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 women's. I bought the largest women's slipper that I could. I didn't care. It's not like pink, but even if it was, I wouldn't have cared as long as it was big enough. Put that shit on at home. I would say like two and a half inches of my heel is sticking out of the damn back of them. Son of a bitch. <laughs> There's really no women out there with feet that are equivalent to size 12 men's. Now I got to go get some slippers from out. Now I got a pair of slippers. My wife's not going to wear them. She's not a women's large. She's like a foot size. She's probably a women's medium. My kid's not going to wear them. She's three years old. I can't wear them. I'm going to trip down the stairs. What am I going to do, man? I got to buy a second pair of slippers. I'm only seven, but my wife thinks I'm 5'9". Am I living a lie? You can't sneak a Brian Jordan Alvarez reference by me. This is a song about Joseph. <clears throat> I just, I'm never going to tell my wife how tall I am <laughs> because it's, she doesn't know. So I am 5'7". But my wife thinks I'm 5'9". That's right. That dude is on a wave right now. I thought the era of... Um, thank, thank you for this act of charity finding the secret room, by the way. I thought the era of skit comedy had come to an end. I thought that in today's cynical world, you couldn't make it work. Whoo! BGA has brought us back. We can appreciate little jokes again. You see that airplane uh, wing that ripped, or the, <laughs> the wing, sorry, the door that blew off mid-flight? Oh, man. That's crazy, man. I did not like that. It's messed up. But how, like, I uh, don't believe in a higher power, but, like, it kind of makes you... I wouldn't say it un atheist pills me, but you're like, really? The two people who were supposed to be sitting there in the seats that got ripped out just happened to miss their flight that day? That's pretty crazy. If it was me that missed my flight, like I'm an atheist, but it, if it had been me that missed the flight, I would just, I'd probably start going to church at least. Now, because it didn't happen to me, I'm still going to maintain my atheism. If it had been my ticket though, I'm going to church that Sunday. Because at that point, I don't think I can afford to take chances. <laughs> that's like a sign from above that's like... 
I'm watching you, bro. Which one? Whatever is closest, probably. Or maybe, like, whichever one has a, uh... <laughs> Has like a slightly later mass. I don't think I would really want to go to mass at like, what time is it normally? Maybe it starts at nine? I could do, nine's actually a little late for me. Is there like a 7.30 mass? 6 a.m. is common? That's a little early. That's like devout. I don't think I'm at that level <laughs> yet, to be honest. I mean, first off, I got to narrowly avoid a plane crash. So we got a ways to go. Like this, we're thinking long term here. Send it. <laughs> when you hit me with the lion, what for? When your wife hits you with an emote like that, you you are forced to respond. Hello. Hello to you as well. Maybe it's, it's more of like a lion what because our daycare provider sent us a text yesterday and said she was sick, so she is taking today off, which is fine. Everybody got the damn flu. I know. It's kind of crazy. Me not getting sick, finally getting the chance to ask people, oh, is your, what's wrong with your immune system? And now there's a global pandemic, don't you realize? Oh, so when I get sick, people can type fucked up shit like, what's wrong with your body? You get the sniffles and all of a sudden, like, I'm, uh, I'm anti-science. It doesn't make sense, bro. You get poop sick? I know this way worse. <laughs> You're watching Netflix. I developed a callus on my anus. We are not the same. But also, they will not divide us. That's my new thing, is dividing us and then saying he will not divide us. Who's they? I don't know. Anybody that you think is your enemy, <laughs> I guess. Is poop sick or puke sick worse? That's not even close. Puke sick is way worse than poop sick. It's puke sick is worse by a mile. Like, if you ask anybody, would you rather ha have diarrhea or throw up, and they say diarrhea, they're not to be trusted. They're a compromised agent. They are sent by a foreign power to undermine you. Puking kind of fun? Nah, no. You're insane. The part of puking sickness where you puke is it feels good because it's a, a feeling of relief. But that is merely a return to uh, baseline illness. It's not that it feels good in the process. It's the relief of like, oh, hopefully my stomach pain it will subside now. Hopefully my nausea will subside now. Diarrhea, you're mostly just like, I gotta poop. And then you poop and it's like liquid. And then maybe like it kind of hurts. So puking, like puking sickness is way worse than pooping sickness, bro. Yeah, no, nobody's like, oh, I gotta throw up. I'm just gonna go, like, watch some Netflix for 15 minutes. That's like a whole body experience. And trust me, I've had enough of both. <laughs> I can't tell if NL's defending puking or hating on puking. I'm not defending or hating on it. I'm saying I'm, it's worse than diarrhea. Nobody's like, well, I hope, not too many people. There was this one internet video I saw. There were two girls, but there was only one cup. And I said, limited resources. Let's see where this goes. And then I was like, ah, turn it off. And then play it again in 0.5x speed. But um, puking is way worse than diarrhea, bro. It's not even close. Normally, I try to um, see all sides. You know, there's 7 billion plus people on Earth each with their own memories and experience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's easy to see how on the subject of preference, there could be a multitude of different options, right? But puking versus diarrhea, I mean, I just have a, I, I, I have serious questions for anybody that would rather puke than, than have diarrhea. You mean the other way? What are you talking about? Am I, have I forgotten how to speak English? I'm saying pooping is more annoying. Or sorry, now okay, now you got me twisted up. I'm saying puking is way worse than diarrhea. Way worse. It doesn't. It it feels worse in all ways. You keep getting it twisted. That's because I state my thesis clearly, and then some motherfucker who's watching 17 TikToks while they watch the stream. It's like, wait, I missed that. Can you say it? Like, you've got to restate things 
55 times in order for people to understand what you're saying, even though it's a simple sentence. And then people are trying, they're explaining it to me. They're like, when you get diarrhea, your stomach really hurts. Bro, didn't you watch the librarian food poisoning arc? I did. Then you're preaching to the converted, bro. I know all about the stomach pain. You didn't even mention the leg rot yet. Oh, you've never had that? Then shut it. How is your leg healed up? It was totally fine once they finally gave me the medicine that normally they're holding because they supply it to uh, Tyson Poultry Farms. Can't afford to just be giving it out willy-nilly to people who are sick, probably from eating the antibiotic-resistant chickens that were made at Tyson Poultry Farms. My bad, G. Username Tyson Chicken Nugget. Okay, that's a that's a plus two. That's definitely a plus two. Why don't you play the wrestling game anymore? The wrestling game. You talking about Rumbleverse? There's a lot of stuff. Librarian, how are the analytics looking? Hang on. Chibli said something about a denim jacket. <laughs> it got swept away by the emotes. Well, we. We're waiting. He will not divide us, made me buy a denim jacket. He will not divide us, made me buy a denim jacket. Okay, Dr. Seuss. He just took a shit in the Dr. Seuss toilet and it's giving mother. Okay, fucking when Tweedle Beetle's battle in a battle in a bottle and the bottle's on a poodle and the poodle's eating noodles. We call it a Tweedle Beetle paddle bottle pottle battle fucking, I don't know. He will not divide us. <laughs> He took a shit in the mother toilet and didn't flush. The t <laughs> I did see the tweet where Vivek Ramaswamy is giving his wife a tribute. He calls her a throat surgeon, which she like literally is. But if you've been online too much, you can't read that as like her actually being a doctor. Like it's like, <laughs> it sounds like, like a rap music term. It's so good. The throat doctor, or throat surgeon, it's even better. No offense to the doctors out there. <laughs> oh, man. That's real. If you can't laugh at that on either side of the aisle, you got to step back and, and remember what it means to be human, okay? Yeah, I saw the New Jersey Devils fan get a finger in his butt during the national anthem. And then I saw the whole team get a finger in their butt. You see the Bass Pro Shops thing? Yep, yeah, I saw the dude get in the Bass Pro Shops thing. Again, it's uh, another example of small dick uh, bias, by the way. So the dude who got into the Bass Pro Shops uh, pool naked, was it a grower, to put it politely? And everybody thinks it's okay to make fun of him because his penis is small. Oh, so it'd be okay to take a, a skinny dip in the Bass Pro Shops water tank if you had a huge fucking hammer on you that's not fair that's not how we're supposed to treat people in society we're not supposed to divide people based on the color of their skin or their language or their religion or the size of the wedding tackle they got between their legs the small dicked need an absolutely comically enormously dicked ally like me to say it. Because a lot of big dick dudes like me, and I hear them talk all the time because we run in the same circles, they'll say things like, look at that dude's small penis. And I have to be the one with courage to say, hey, 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 just because we're hanging dong and making everybody else jealous at the YMCA, that doesn't mean that he didn't choose it. He will not divide us. I'm high and I feel like I'm dipping in and out of the conversation. That's your fault, just for the record. I can follow everything that I'm saying. And you might say, that's not true. Well, then how the hell am I making callbacks to shit that we were talking about like two hours and 15 minutes ago? It's because I got the damn chat GPT-4 running up here constantly, you know, every, you know how much mental processing power it takes? Every sentence you say, retroactively seeing if you can apply that to any of the eight jokes so far this stream that were actually funny to get a second laugh, to use every part of the buffalo. That's hard, man. I wish it wasn't doing, I wish it devoted the energy to something a little bit more productive. But it, it's just what it is. I don't know what to tell you. Why not let the AI take over? 
they're not ready yet, okay? That's the thing. It's like AI is it's the smartest thing we got, and yet it still has not produced one organic laugh in the industry's entire history. Something spiritual about comedy. That's why I feel like comedians in many ways are kind of like the modern-day philosophers, the mystics who look to the stars and derive truth from only illusion. One of the most unfairly persecuted classes of profession on the planet in history, without a doubt. Okay, I will say, and this is me being honest. Someone said, what about the bottomless pit copy pasta? That is funny. If that was actually made by uh, AI, they, they nailed that one. The one that, you know, get to work, it's bottomless. That one is good. But I still feel like that one might have just been constructed by a particularly smart individual. And then they pretended it was AI to get some more, some eyes on it. But I'm not like that, dis well, I guess I am kind of cynical about AI. I'm not cynical about AI in the same way that like, you know, I don't, I don't think that they're gonna be putting the chat GPT-9 into the Boston Dynamics robots and, um, you know, sicken them on us. I think it'll be much more uh, insidious and it will be the same way like every technological revolution eventually gets disseminated and corrupted. It'll be to get you to buy like three more things every time you walk into the grocery store for more money than you thought you were going to spend. <laughs> it's probably not going to be like, you know, robot sharpshooters or something like that. It's probably going to be like Loblaws using their AI model. So they, they already have those smart price tags. They're going to like scan your phone when you walk into the store to get all of your meta metadata, savings, consumption habits, salary, stuff like that. And then, as you walk down the aisle, it will detect your position in the grocery store and it will change the prices on the price tag uh, based on your disposable income. So, you know, when, when a wealthier person walks down the aisle, the $2.49 potato chips are going to be $7.99 and they're going to be none the wiser. And we'll call it innovation. It's based? It's not based. Because... The money from the wealthy people is just going to a richer motherfucker. <laughs> it's not going to the government, dummy. The EU will call it illegal. I know, and then like some dude who, you know, is 22 years old and as a startup building email 3.0 in San Francisco will be like, this is why Europe is always behind. The government won't let the people have nice things like dynamically increasing prices based on the demographic of the person who walked into the grocery store. It is, so it, it, it's still dystopian. It's just less openly dystopian, like a robot's gonna shoot you in the head and more like, you know, they'll probably just squeeze you a little bit more every time you go anywhere. Maybe that's worse, I don't know. I, I think it's probably better, but it, it would make a much worse movie. <laughs> Watch this. Chibli can never. At least Chibli's got a denim jacket. Jean jackets kind of... So they were big when I was a kid. Like really young. Um, and then they were not in vogue for a while. But then they became in vogue again. For like... A year and a half. Are they already gone? Fashion is cyclic? Yeah, but like the ramen noodle haircut for men has been around for like five, six years now. Jean jackets came and went in a season and a half. Like it's, it just, I guess different things move at different speeds, but still. No one does ramen hair anymore? You need to, um, I don't know where you live, but it sounds like you live in Ohio. This is a great big world out there. There's a lot of ramen, broccoli haircuts out there. What's interesting is, it's, so it's very popular with uh, young men. If you see a young man by himself, he will not have the ramen hair. But if you see a group of young men, I would say between the ages of 13 and 21, they will all have the broccoli hair, which indicates to me, and this is the insidious part, 
it's a self-propagating haircut. Like it's it's a mimetic haircut that gets uh, transferred from like a host to to another host. And I think that might be the first haircut of that kind. It briefly, the only other time I've ever studied this in my career, and it actually was even more insidious because it happened over the airwaves, was when Jennifer Aniston was the first uh, patient zero, the noted case of uh, the Rachel haircut. And that, even my mom got that one, but she got better. That one was crazy because it was the first uh, transmission in history that didn't require contact between a host and a target. It actually was able to, to do its dirty work over the television airwaves. I thought we were talking about JT ramen. Well, Justin Timberlake, it's a different kind. It's ramen for sure, but it's more in the same vein as almost, I would call it like a, a mid-length Chad Kroger type ramen haircut. I'm talking more about the, the shaved sides and the broccoli on top. That's frosted tips. No, no, you got it confused. Justin Timberlake, he, you can't have frosted tips when you have curly hair. He had, I'll admit, he had like a, a prototype Maruchan ramen haircut. He, he might be patient zero, but he, he, it was within containment back then. Somehow TikTok has allowed it to breach. Sometime the ramen noodle, I don't know why I said sometime. <laughs> I've undermined my point. Sometimes the ramen noodle haircut looks good. I'm not saying it looks bad. I'm just saying it is, uh, it's everywhere. Mullets? No, you got young people confused with Jean de Carouge from Ridley Scott's The Last Duel. Now, it's a, I, you're based for making the error, but it's erroneous nonetheless. Holy cow, someone mentioned Kitsilano in here. We got a real Vancouver head. And they didn't even say Kitsilano, they said Kits. That's how you know they're living in East Van. Oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, man. You got me with the East Van too? I know, because East Van, I mean, what are you doing calling somebody from Kits, like using the shorthand as if they were the hipster, bro? You ever walk down Commercial Drive? Shit is mullet central. And not just the men, but the women and children too. As Hayden Christensen, noted Vancouver native, would say. You ever seen him? No. <laughs> I don't think, the only famous person I've ever seen in Vancouver is Dan Bayar. Dan Bejar, Dan Behar, and even then I didn't know 100% that it was him until he had already passed me by. I was walking on the uh, on the seawall. I saw a very cool-looking middle-aged man who looked like Destroyer walk by me, and I said, "Huh, that guy looks familiar." And then, like, I did the the meme where. Um, you know, the one where the distracted boyfriend, is that it? Where he's walking away and he looks back. I saw Cole Sprouse in a Mount Pleasant sandwich shop in 2019. Okay, but here's the important question. What's the, uh, what sandwich shop? It's called Cafe Tika. It's not a chain. All right, I don't know it. You got me there. You Vancouver hipstered me. I didn't think it would be a chain, by the way. I just thought possibly I would, heard, I would have heard of it. You know, I've, I've spent some time in Mount Pleasant. Cole Sprouse fought my dad. Hey, this is a good time for me to admit, I don't know who Cole Sprouse is. Is he on one of those, like, CW shows? <laughs> I've heard his name before. He's like a, a young adult actor, right? He's from The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. He's Dylan Sprouse's brother. I don't know who Dylan Sprouse is either, bro. I don't know shit about the Sprouse clan. He's also on Riverdale. Oh, like Charles Melton? Exactly like Charles Melton. Okay. <laughs> you know him from Big Daddy? He's the kid from Big Daddy? And he's on Riverdale? Wouldn't he? He's like my age then. Who the hell did he play? Principal Weatherby? <laughs> I can't believe I remember Archie's principal's name, man. Thank you, Brain. That was like the perfect way to finish that one off. One time, Justin Chatwin tossed a firecracker at my brother when we were kids in Nanaimo. Finally, we're dealing with an A-lister. Justin Chatwin, of course, most famous for Dragon Ball Evolution, where he played Goku, by the way. He wasn't a bit part in that movie. That's a deep pull. It's literally all I know him from, to be honest with you. <laughs> I once ran into Greg Proops. I don't really think I've met anybody famous. 
There was like, uh, well, I went to school with Michael A.L. Fox, but uh, at Champions of Fire 1, there was a, a meet and greet arranged for us. And Amazon staff that are watching this, I don't blame you, okay? It was a zero interest rate environment. You know, but it, it just didn't seem like a fit to me that after the event, we went to like a, um, the, the club in Caesar's Palace and there was a meet and greet with Chuck the Iceman Liddell. Like I had just gotten through two days of playing Amazon Kindle Fire games for money. <laughs> but like we showed up too late to meet Chuck the Iceman Liddell. Which honestly seemed fine, because I don't watch the UFC, so I really would have just been like taking a picture just to be like, hey, this is a guy someone told me is famous. Like, it's better for him to have his time for himself than wasted with me, who's... It's not like I'm not a fan because I don't like him, I just don't know who he is. And that's like, I don't know. I guess at Champions of Fire 2, I didn't realize that DJ Rehab is actually like a pretty famous DJ. So I met him and spent some time on the couch with him and shook his hand and stuff like that. But it was only like years later that I discovered that he's actually like famous. Other than that, get yeah, Dan, man. Dan is pretty famous in certain circles. Anyway, I, I, I don't, I've never met that many famous people, honestly. And I'm out and about, which means they must not be out and about. I guess when they come to Vancouver, they're... They're hiding. <laughs> or we're not running in the same circles. Crazy, I never ran into like Logan Paul picking my kid up from Jimboree. Otherwise, the most, I don't count this because it's, it's getting high on your own supply. The most famous people I've ever met are like other streamers and YouTubers. But like, I'm also in the business, so I almost don't count it, right? That would be like, well, maybe this is getting high on my own supply. So I think it would be like asking Meryl Streep, like, who the most famous person she'd ever met is. <laughs> and she'd be like, you know, I'm like uh, an actress. I actually think like just seeing a famous person, I wouldn't walk up to them and say like I recognize them. It would have to be someone that like, I don't know, whose work like I, I really, really, really identify with. Like, I've been talking up Matt Damon. If I was at a subway and Matt Damon was in front of me, I don't think I would say, hey, hey, Matt Damon, I love your work. I think I would just let Matt Damon, I would give him the gift of, of solitude. What am I going to say to Matt Damon? Hey, you're Matt Damon? He's going to be like, you're right. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> I'm going to be like, I enjoy the movies you act in. And he's going to be like, that's why we make them. I'm sure the bro's just trying to, he's probably doing the same thing that I'm doing, rehearsing the order in my head so that I get the ingredients right when I get up to the front. Hi, can I have a foot long Italian herbs and cheese uh, oven roasted chicken breast, please? Yes, cheese and toasted. Like, are you just repeating that over and over in my head? Me, when the call of the void hits at Subway. Hi, can I have a foot long cock? I mean, oh fuck, a foot long penis. Um, can I have a foot of <laughs> dick in? <laughs> Um, 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 I mean, can I have a cheese and toasted penis? Uh, can I get toasted peanut butter and jelly? Uh, although I will say, I have a, a friend who used, and this, we're going several layers deep here. I have a friend who lived in an apartment building where one of his neighbors rented, like, their side hustle their side hustle was they rented their apartment to actors and actresses who were in Vancouver for like long shoots. So apparently, and this is hearsay, they said that in like 2003, Halle Berry stayed in their apartment for like, I don't know, like two months while they were shooting Catwoman here. So apparently it does happen, but... <laughs> Yeah, they signed her basketball. <laughs> Must be a nice apartment. You know what the crazy thing was? Not really. Like, it was not a bad apartment, but it's not the kind of apartment you would expect, you know, like a Hollywood celebrity to be, like, living in. But, I mean, they're only there for two months. It's nicer than a hotel room, for sure. My neighbor is Brad Pitt's contractor, but I live in L.A., so it's more like I'm saying I know a guy. <laughs> okay, I, I see you. I just... 
I mean, you can run the numbers, right? Like, I mean, obviously it's clumped geographically to, to big cities, I'm sure. But how many famous people are there worldwide? Like, from a, from a Western context, because obviously, like, I could have passed by celebrities, like, every day in South Korea, and I wouldn't have known. There must be, like, 50,000, and maybe any given person might recognize 2,500. And then how many... I can't do this math anymore. I've gotten too far. <laughs> I've gotten too many digits. You wouldn't recognize... You would recognize 50 famous... I'm basically asking, can you name 50 people you've never met? If the answer is no, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> you can't? Come on. You're watching... You, you got me already. And then I stream with like 12 other people. I've never met you? That's what I'm saying! But if you saw me, you would be like, I know who that is. I'm not saying you've met 2,500 famous people. Are you insane? Who are you? Brad Pitt's contractor's neighbor? It's you and Smosh? That's fucking sad. You gotta look at the liner jackets of your books, man. It's just me and Smosh? This shit is gonna... You're bumming me the fuck out, dude. <laughs> I'm flattered that you recognize me and Smosh, but like you gotta broaden your horizons a little bit on top of that. I'm so ready. Let's do it. All right. Uh, so without further ado, welcome everybody. It's Guess the Rotten Tomato Score with Bear and Northern Lion. I stole this idea from other YouTubers, but that's That's, okay. that's the way to do it. That's just how YouTube works these days. And it just seems like a fun idea. So we're gonna go for it. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we're gonna take turns suggesting films. And then we're going to talk about the movies for a little bit. And then we're going to guess what we think was the critic score and the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes Ooh, okay. for that movie. We're going to get a point for getting the closest to the critic score. We're going to get a point for getting closest to the audience score. So there's a total of two points available per film. Cool. Okay, so you don't know the other You don't know the results either. No, not at all. I, I have no idea of the critic or audience scores for any of the movies I'm about to list. But then how did you pick the movie? <laughs> you just gonna have to find out. Man. Well, all, all right, all right. <laughs> I did try to get a mix of what I thought would be like higher rated films and lower rated stuff, and a couple in between too. I'm gonna start us off. I'm gonna bring us uh, back just a little bit to I think it was 2012. Okay. I want to say for Cabin in the Woods. So I'm gonna tell you that I Cabin in the Woods. Have you seen it? I have. I'm gonna guess that you enjoy this movie a lot. I do. I liked it quite a bit. I also enjoy this movie quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I, um, if I remember correctly, I used to go to Rotten Tomatoes like every day. Uh, well, That's why I was kind of worried about playing this with you because I was like, this dude has probably retained maybe like 75% of the film scores that he's seen. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hoping. And I, I feel like I recall Cabot in the Woods having a ridiculously high Rotten Tomatoes critic score that I'm going to say is 92. Ooh, wow. Okay. And then, uh, well, I don't see, know. I was, I was wondering, man, because like I, I, I know that in the moment it was like so, it subverted people so well. Like obviously in, in hindsight, I think a, a couple more movies have gone this route, but... This was the first to really just sort of take it in this direction. So I guess it makes sense that it would be that high of the critical acclaim. I think the audience reception is going to be even higher, but you can't get much higher than 92. That's up there. My hypothesis for this is that the audience score will also be high, but I think two things are going to pull it below the critic score. One yeah. is a, a twist this outrageous. I think like... 8% of the population just rejects it. As soon as it happens, no matter how good a twist is, they just go, oh, come on. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm going to say 87. So 92 okay, critics, okay. 87 audience is my, that's my gut check. I, I think you've actually sold me on the idea of going even higher for my critic score. Ooh. I'm going to go ahead and say critics were up at a 96. I'm going to say they absolutely love this one. I'm going to say audiences up there. I'm going to go with a 97 audience. I think this is a, a well-loved film. All right. So let's, let's re uh, recap on that. You, you went with a 92 critic and a 95? Nin 92 audience? critic, 87 audience. 87 audience. Okay. So here we go. 
Our first official result. Official tomato meter. 92%. Look at you oh, go. Holy. Ah, geez. I'm, I'm, I'm almost tempted to give you a bonus point right out of the gate here, man. God damn. Well, let's not go crazy. Yeah, that's a bit much. All right, so we'll give you the one. It just had the that's, vibe of a 92. I don't know how to explain it. That's actually a two-pointer for you right out of the gate. That's a 74. On the 74? I know. That's honestly shocking. Like The audience, they don't deserve this. They don't deserve this movie. Even back then. I mean, I do, I do wonder, too, because you can rate movies on Rotten Tomatoes at any point, right? It doesn't yeah, yeah. like within a certain window. So I suppose that could actually have been the effect that I was talking about a little earlier, where like as the, or as the movie has become less groundbreaking, maybe people see it mm. like a decade later and they're like, ah, oh, come on. That's right. Not, it's like the thing not where that special. when I finally saw The Godfather, I was like, I don't get it. It's just a mafia <laughs> movie. I didn't realize that that's because I saw The <laughs> Simpsons reference the stuff from The Godfather like 40 times. You, you, you they were invented ahead, it. Of the, uh, ahead of the curve there. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, what about Crank High Voltage? The, Ooh, two, the 2009 that's, uh, sequel to Crank. That's a Statham joint, isn't it? Now, this if you've Crank never seen... In, in Crank 1, Jason Statham is poisoned by the mob, and right. the only way he can stay alive is to keep his heart rate high uh, so that his adrenaline counteracts the poison. In Crank 2, um, he needs to administer an electric shock to his body to keep his heart pumping. Yes, that, that actually, that's what I thought the first Crank was. It's weird to me to hear you explain the plot to Crank and it not be the plot to Crank 2, because that was the entire version of that that I had in my mind. Well, what's crazy is that it's, they do take place all in essentially the same day. So, like, at the end of <laughs> Crank Holy 1, shit. he, like, falls out of an airplane, and then it starts from right there in Crank 2. Oh, my God. That's a, that's a busy 24 hours, dude. This is... I, I think I would like this, actually. I think I would like this movie if I sat down and watched it judgment-free. If, if Crank and Crank High Voltage have one uh, fan, it is me. And if they have no fans, then I am dead. <laughs> I, I think that, that these are... Very, very good action comedies. As long, yeah. I think some people look at them and they go, that's ridiculous. And yeah. it's ridiculous, but almost every action movie is in a way ridiculous. Absolutely. Like, it was really, Jason on. Statham is ridiculous, man. He's like a cartoon character. I mean, if you wait till he hooks his tongue up to the car battery and then has Bai Ling rev the engine, and then tell me he's not a cartoon character. Let's say if Crank launched at like a 73 this is probably like a 67 audience probably likes it a little more but not much i'm gonna go with a 71 audience score okay i so you're going 67 71 yeah yeah i think that this was a good choice because i feel like exactly the opposite in both ways really I feel like this, I agree with the sense that I think it's going to be mediocre from the critics. I think it's going to be, I'm going to say 57. Okay. But then I actually think, and this might be the, the most insane part, I think that the audience is going to take themselves too seriously and dislike it even more. Mm. I, I have a hypothesis. My, my basic heuristic for looking at movie reviews, the better a movie is, the greater the gulf between the critics and the audience scores. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I if a movie is amazing, 98 critics, 62% audience. If a movie There's is horrible, 12% critics, 82% audience. Like completely absent the quality of the movie itself. It's the simple matter of there being like a consensus on something either being great or terrible is going to draw in contrarians. You just want to be like, I don't know. I don't think so. Exactly. So I think that this movie is good. Ergo, the audience rating will be lower than the critic score. So 57 critics, and I'm going to say 45 audience. Although I gotta, I'm going to say 48 because I can't imagine any audience members that came into Crank 2 wouldn't be familiar with the ridiculousness from Crank 1. So I'm going to say 57-48. Whoo! Okay, it has a 63 on the tomatometer. So I think that, yeah, I, I think I beat you by two. 
Holy. on the critic score. So that was that was a close one. And then it has a forty nine from the audience. That's God a split damn. right there. God damn! You, you have very nearly gotten exact guesses on back to back movies here. Uh, let's try out Asteroid City. Now I can tell you I have not seen Asteroid City, but I can tell you that my parents saw it in theaters and said that it was missable, which to me means that I, I honestly think I'm going to start with the audience score, and I'm going to say that the audience score is going to be surprisingly low. I'm going to say for a Wes Anderson movie, higher than Crank, high voltage though. I'm going to yeah. say 64% on the audience score, but I know that this is indeed, I bet the letterbox score is, is a lot higher because I feel like this has now become uh, a, a more respected, almost like cult classic in the Wes Anderson oeuvre. I'm going to put it at a 73. So I'm going to go 73 and 64. I, I think I might go a little higher with critics. I, I, I just can't help but feel like critics want to like Wes Anderson movies, mm -hmm. just regardless of what they even are. And this is like as, as missable. I, I agree this one's missable. I, w I wouldn't go out of your way to watch this one. But if you like Wes Anderson, th this is extremely Wes Anderson. Like it, it checks Look every the poster. I got God. Yeah. I mean, you watch the trailer for God's sake. It's, it's just quintessential Wes Anderson complete with the ensemble cast. So I think for that reason, I might go a little higher. I might go into like the high seventies, maybe like a 79 mm, for okay, critics or okay. something like that. Seems right to me, but I do think you're right about the audience. I don't think this one really stuck with them. So I'm going to go with like a 59 audience score on this one too. This is going to be a 75 from critics. On the mm, tomato, okay. putting us uh, that that one goes to you as well, I think, right? Because that is you were I was at seventy three. Seventy three, yeah, yeah. God, man, we're close on them though. Uh, audience score, I think, is going to go to me though. It's going to be at a sixty two. Sixty two, yeah, pretty low. I don't know. I said, what did you say? I think what I said sixty four. God, damn. <laughs> you're right. Mm. Oh, that, 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 that hurts. I'm keeping myself honest with this. Person. You are. No, I appreciate that. That's, that's a two pointer for you for sure. But sheesh, that's as close as it can be. Yeah, damn. Right, like, shout out to my mom and my dad for telling me that they thought this one was mediocre. Yeah, yeah. Big swing. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to take something. Let, let's throw you a curveball. How about Batman Returns? And this Ooh, one, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Hang on, delete, no delete is my mute key, so I muted myself. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was saying this movie scarred me because my mom took me to see it in theaters, and yeah. uh, Danny DeVito as the penguin bites somebody's nose off. And now I remember I'm, that. <laughs> now I I'm looking this at this. I remember that. I'm like, this shit came out in 1992. I was three yeah. and a half years old. What was my mom doing taking me to see <laughs> Batman Returns in the movie theater? <laughs> That's crazy, bro. Dude, Danny Danny DeVito as the penguin in this movie is like scary. He's like, scary, yeah. He did a great job on that makeup. Like he is he's got an intimidating presence. What was she thinking? I man? do like Michael Keaton's Batman a lot, and I think that that is like a common opinion. I th I think there's yeah. a lot of love for the Michael Keaton Batman. I think that um if any like listen I'm not going to price prices right. That's disrespectful. Like, oh, I think yeah. it's going to be lower than 86. I'm not going to throw you an 85. I'm going to throw yeah. you, uh, for, for the audience score, I'm going to give you a 75. I'm going to, I'm going to cut it bold. right there. Okay. Okay. And then for the critics, a lot of people forget because we were blessed with, so we basically superhero movies got so good relative to what they used to be that people no longer respect them at all. Which is oh, fair. Yeah. They got they got sick of like seven and eight out of tens. Back yeah. in the day, this was all we had. It was Batman <laughs> Returns, then a decade of garbage, and then Tobey Maguire's Spider Man. Exactly. I was gonna say exactly that. There's yeah. ten years of like you can't make a good superhero <laughs> movie. I think though that that means that I'm remembering it more fondly maybe than it was respected at the time. I'm gonna say it was less critically respected than the first Batman at release at least. Maybe that's not yeah. relevant in 2023. I'm going to put it at a 72 critics, 75 audience. It, it, Bear Taffy, I am pleased to inform you. Mm -hmm. Your critic score was bang on. 81% for the critics. Mm -hmm. That feels good. I, I needed that. 
the audience score of 73 means that I will take the audience score. Yeah, it also right. means that people are haters. I, I you know, if a movie is good, and, well, Rotten Tomatoes is like a weird, it's a consensus model, right? If a movie yeah. is likable, I don't think a critic has a hard time being like, I like this movie, here's a three out of five. Yep. But if, I think that the audience is full of people who want to be haters. I don't know, what, just, what do you think is the highest audience score on the website? Right, fucking like Monty Python on the Holy Grail. <laughs> Eleven, <laughs> 11 <laughs> out of ten. Uh, or uh, Dragon Slayer Doppelganger. Of course, that actually got removed from IMDb. Oh we were, no, we were accused of gaming the system. <laughs> yeah, well, they were to be Which fair. Which they were. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I, I got the one critic nailed at least there. That feels pretty good. Right, for that was me. perfect. Uh, are right, we gonna we're gonna throw it back to one of my all time favorites here with uh, UHF. Oh, okay. I remember this. Let me let me get my ledger prepared here. Being somewhat funny, but not a movie I would expect to do well with the critics. Absolutely not. I think they would find it a little uh, scatter shot, and its its satire would be too on the nose for the coastal academics who make up the uh, movie reviewers at your average publication, especially in 1989. I'm going to say, audience-wise, I can't imagine anyone seeing Weird Al starring in a movie, choosing to watch it, and then being like, that sucked. I'm going to say 79 audience. And then for the critics, I'm going to put out a hit. I'm, I'm actually going to... I'm going to say 20, 28. Oh, boy. Wow. Okay. That's, uh, that's leaving a wide open window for me, although I don't mm -hmm. know if you're wrong. But... Man, I want to go bat. I want to go to bat for this movie because it's it's like I have a special place in my heart for it. I've watched this probably like a dozen times. Like I, I can throw this on at any moment and watch the whole thing and have a great time. Even for a movie that came out in 1989, I still think it's like very funny. There's still a few jokes in this that are still that can still make me laugh. It's got a good cast. It's well acted. Kevin McCarthy. I wish this had a better score than I assume it has, because I also can't help but feel like the critic score is probably like 40, 45. I'll call it, I'll give it a 43, just to give it a little bit of a boost, because I do think it's around that zone. And then I was going to go with a high audience score too, although after just a few movies here in Guess the Rotten Tomato score, I'm beginning to think that the threshold for like a high audience score is a little lower than I initially suspected. Like, I don't think anything's in the 90s, dude. Do you? Like, I feel like no, that might be like a near impossibility. Yeah, I'm realizing. Because yeah. you know what it is? I think the average hater, if they saw something at 100, they'd be like, well, I liked it, but I could also be the guy who took it to 99. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 61. Wow! From the critics, a Apologies, surprisingly high weirdo. score. I was not okay. familiar with your game. Yeah, that's pretty damn good. All right, so I think I'll take the point for the critics score, but I believe you very nearly nailed it again. Audience score 77. Oh, <laughs> so close. But yeah, that'll be a point. For I know you. the I know the people. Yeah, yeah, clearly. I don't agree with them for the record, but I know them. Right. How about the mask? Oh, love it. From 1994, probably. Or 1993. Great idea. Uh, for the mask, boy, what would be the critical reset? Let me, let me Wikipedia this. So just I gotta tell you, bit. if you were on the streets of the playground in 1994, like yeah. Bear and I were, this was the Godfather Part Two. This, this was all you were talking about. Smoking, somebody stop me. Do you feel mm -hmm. lucky, punk? That's a spicy mm -hmm. meatball. Uh, Cameron Diaz in the red dress. That I didn't mean, hit me hello. until a little later, but yes, abs without mm -hmm. a doubt. I saw this in the drive-in movie theater, mm. but it, it, this is weird because apparently I was old enough to see Batman Returns. But for The Mask, my parents were like, it was the second movie out of two. The first one was Monkey Trouble. The second one was The Mask. They said, just go in the backseat and close your eyes if it gets too scary. So I mm. kept my eyes closed the whole time. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw it on VHS like a year later, and I was like, that's funny. But when the mask takes over, I was still pretty scared. It's freaky, dude, yeah. When he tries to Don't pull it off mind. his face, but the, the mask is sticking to his face. Oh, man. Dude, you got me Googling monkey trouble, too. I, had, I had completely removed this from my mind. Yeah, and then I, I, we have like forced moves with monkey trouble. Because I'm always like, yeah, it's Anna Paquin, and she like a monkey escapes from a 
cosmetics factory or something. And then they're like, it's not Anna Paquin, it's Thora Birch. Like I've, I've done this. True. I've told this story <laughs> like 20 <laughs> times. <laughs> Um, monkey right, in a uh, hotel? No, you fool! That's Dunstan checks in, and it's a chimpanzee. It's completely different primate-based medias. Okay. Have the gall to call Dunstan checks in monkey at a hotel. Come Next, on. you're it's gonna a dignified film. You're gonna tell me that Monkey Trouble is the one where the dude plays hockey. Uh, that's MVP, most valuable primate. <laughs> okay, I, I think I'm taking higher on the mask. On the critics. On the critics. I'm going to take wow. an 81 on the critics. Wow. Wow. And then I'm, I'm almost going to flip you. I'm going to take an 81 on the critics. I'm going to take a 77 on the audience. I think there's some people out there who still just resent Jim Carrey. Oh, God damn it, dude. <laughs> I'm all right. I, I, I'm spoiling your, your reveal, I know, but I switched it to <laughs> I'm so Critics <laughs> score 80%. Ah. You had 77. I had 81. You beat me by two again. <laughs> Audience score, 68. I got 77. You got 83. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's two more for two more for NL, son of a bitch. I feel like we're learning. I'm, I've been beating this drum that the critics are smart and the audience is stupid for yeah. probably 10 years. Every time I bring it up, people accuse me of being out of touch. Yeah? Really? The, the critics... Love the mask and the audience thinks is mid. Where do you fall on the side of that? It's not my fault that people who can ex uh, appreciate true beauty end up working at the Chicago Tribune, okay? <laughs> I mean, I, so let me, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you then. You, you want something a little more standard? You want to go with a wild card? Oh, yeah. a wild card, absolutely. You got to get a wild card in, right? All right, so let me, get, let me hit you with uh, Pixar's The Good Dinosaur. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen The Good Dinosaur. You have? That's I have. shocking to me. Um, it is the beginning of Pixar having a mid-off. Yes. It is. It is precisely why I chose it, because I thought that it would be very difficult for us to, like, pin down exactly how mid it is. The, the only real frame of reference I have for The Good Dinosaur is a what appears to me to be universal consensus that this is the point at which Pixar began to fall off. It, right? We couldn't because believe like, that they could make something that wasn't at least an eight out of ten. But that's it's it's insane that they maintained that, like at, like not even really uh, subjectively, like uh, again, an almost universal acclaim to just like some of the best animated films of the last fifteen years. It's well, all Pixar. yeah. They they put out like you got to remember from two thousand and three. Through like the like good dinosaur. Five years, for God's sake, yeah. It, they they went like Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo, mm -hmm. Ratatouille, mm -hmm. Up, Wally. -E. Like they were just these, these they were knocking them out, out of the of park. Films. These are ten out of ten. Like every single one is. And just it's true. Insane. People, I will say people forgave Cars because the audience is bringing up Cars. That's true. But I think people were like they they gave them. A commercial one. They said, you know what? They're just making cars to sell toys. They got to do that in order to finance, you know, yeah, Wally yeah. 2 or the whatever. The Good Dinosaur. So The Good Dinosaur was really where It's almost like rather than... This is not a cynical movie. Like, they meant to tell a story and they just messed it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nah, that, There's no Lightning McQueen in this, okay? The, nobody's well, going as The Good Dinosaur for Halloween. What is it to you that, like... Is, is it really just, like, a matter of it being underwhelming or boring or do you find yourself as you're watching the good dinosaur just like having a certain level of expectation that they didn't meet or what was it about the movie that was like off-putting if anything what i recall is just watching it and being like this feels like a dreamworks movie like it, oh, it feels yeah. like instead of it being like a timeless like hans christian anderson fable yeah. uh it it feels like at any point the good dinosaur could start dancing the gangnam style okay <laughs> That's, that's a weirdly uh, effective way of conveying the idea of a DreamWorks movie. <laughs> I'm okay. going gonna, gonna to give it a 58 from the critics. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, not, it's mostly just a disappointing movie. It's not like it's yeah, yeah. horrible. And I'm going to say this is the rare one where the audience prefers it because a lot of people are going to be watching this with their kids and they're going to be like, ah, uh, it kept them busy for 90 minutes or like three hours or however long yeah. the movies are these days. I'm going to put it up, not much higher, but I'm going to put it up at 65. I'm going to take your guesses and add 10 to each of them. Starring Jeffrey Wright. What? Yeah, he plays the 
father of the good dinosaur, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's so, dude, what a wasted cast. Look at this. Okay. Oh, Sam a, Elliott, yeah. Anna Paquin, Jeffrey Wright, and Francis McDormand. What are we doing Holy here cow. having them do the voice actors for a dinosaur family that gets washed away by a flood like 30 uh, minutes into it? That just makes me think of, uh, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to remember the actor's name. The, uh, the, the Steve the Pirate from Dodgeball. Uh, oh, Alan Tudyk. Tudyk. Alan yeah. Tudyk. Yeah, that, that always makes me think of how they had him voice the chicken in Moana. And <laughs> just looking at the behind the scenes footage of that is so fucking good. I went to Julia. Uh, man, I really wish I'd inverted my scores here, although I think I might have still gotten both. We oh. got a 75 from critics. Washed. Surprisingly critics high. are There's washed. Certified fresh. Now that's a, the, I, the red tomato I can see, but a gold seal behind it. I that's don't, a, I can't stand for that. That's something there. Certified Audience fresh scored, used to mean something. Right. <laughs> it used to be the blue check mark of Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> Uh, 64 audience score. So yours, I think was, a, I think if I had not made my final adjustment to my audience score, I think I might've stuck in on that. Point. Well, I, I say 65 for my audience score. So, I'm, oh, man. All I'm right. I, oh, that's right. Cause I added your 10 and then, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You still got it. Still got it. All right, I mean, I, I, I guess I got to take the splits where I can get them, but geez, I mean, you're starting to Holy. run away with this already. Let's go with a landmark of Utah adjacent cinema. How about? Oh, I think I know what it's gonna be. How about Napoleon Dynamite? I had a feeling. <laughs> I had a feeling. That's a good one. Because I think it might take place in Idaho. It, I mean, obviously, with my growing up in a Mormon community, uh, I feel like the, the, it was a an atomic bomb of cultural impact. Like, <laughs> was it controversial? Was there like not in any way? No, oh, everybody people loved, loved it. it. Okay, people loved Napoleon Dynamite around. My, I mean, I, everybody loved it, obviously, but like, like specifically in my high school, it was the, it was all anything anyone ever cared about. There were at least five distinct <laughs> renditions of the uh, dance scene performed at okay, either, yeah. uh, assemblies or talent shows that I can recall through the course of my high school experience after that film came out. Yeah, like we just quoted it. We didn't have that level of dedication. I can't believe how much people like to do it to the point where like it's probably infecting my perception of the critical uh, critical response. I want to say this is up there and like maybe I was, I'm going to start with audience score here and I think it's going to be okay. bonkers high. I'm going to go give this our highest yet. I'm going to say like an 87. Okay, 87 for the audience for the score audience here for Napoleon Dynamite. For Napoleon Dynamite for the critical reception. Let's see, let's keep it in that range. I'm going to my gut's telling me 81. Was it polarizing? People are saying. I didn't realize there was a, I, an element of controversy to it. I don't know if it was polarizing. I think it's it's hard to look back and remember that this is actually like sort of a weird movie to watch. Yeah. Like when it has a much different tone than like your average Vince Vaughn, Owen Wilson comedy from the Absolutely. same era. So I, I do think that there were... A, a decent chunk of the population that that didn't really vibe with it, yeah. but I still think that you're, I think you're you're close. I do think that the critic. This is an independent movie. We probably never right. would have heard about it were it not for the critics championing it when it, yep. you know, played in six theaters in New York and Los Angeles. I think we as millennials get it, but maybe it doesn't quite hit the same way for. I don't know. My parents were were into Napoleon Dynamite. They weren't yeah. quoting it the way we were, but they were like, it's really funny. I do think, yeah, like uh, someone in my chat just said, I think it's not as funny or popular to kids these days. Like, I don't think it's Zoomer humor at all. There's not a single skibbity toilet. <laughs> Closest thing is the time machine he buys off of eBay. I'm going to go a little lower. I'm going to disrespect it. I'm going to give it a 68 on the audience score. Wow, but it's really, I think disparity. it deserves higher than that, but I think the audience might disrespect it. It has a mm -hmm. 72 on the oh. tomato meter. Mm. Come on, audience. You Come say, on, audience. You say 81. I said 75. I'll take the 75. Yep. And then it has a 74 from the audience. Oh, is that still you, though? It is still me, even though I, I disrespected it. Oh, man. <laughs> Don't sound so uh, disappointed. Come on. I'm doing well, my... I mean, this is a good movie. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's true. It's just... Uh... 
I'm mean, honestly, I, I want to bring this up just because I'm curious to see if you have seen it. Uh, a movie called Homeward Bound. Oh, The Incredible Journey. Yeah. I did Although see I don't it. know if the first one had mm. such a subtitle. Is this, uh, this is the 1993 movie? The original release, yeah. Homer Holy Bounds, cow. 1993, yeah. Posters that go hard, bro. That cat is like, get me out of here. Yeah. I mean, that <laughs> I mean so would I. <laughs> <laughs> it is on a log traveling down the rapids, so. They're going wild with it, man. You ever Brian, had this Michael happen? Jay Fox? What the fuck? I just he must that. have been the golden retriever. Yeah, I think so. You ever, as a kid, um, like be too young to appreciate the original and then you watch the sequel for like on VHS a thousand times and then you get older and you're talking to people and then you say something like, it's crazy how Ghostbusters 2 is like so much better than the first one. And then they mm -hmm. all look at you like you got a railroad spike through your head. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened to me with this movie. Like, I think I've yeah. seen Homeward Bound once, but I've seen the sequel where they're lost in San Francisco like a thousand times. I bet if you, know you were I mean? to look it up, I bet Homeward Bound 2 Lost in San Francisco fucking sucks ass. <laughs> As a kid, I was like, this is incredible. They got lost again. I honestly wonder how well Homeward Bound uh, stands up to the test of time because I remember thinking that this movie was epic. It's hard for me to believe that something so steeped in nostalgia couldn't have an high, a high audience score. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that at 72. Okay. Not out, insanely high. But then critics-wise, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb, and this might be a little crazy, I'm going to give it like a, like a 38. Whoa. I think critics are a little too self-serious to give great reviews en masse to a movie that has dubbed uh, voices talking over animals. I think talking mm. animals that are not animated is like poison for critics. But this was in 1993. This might be like one of the first times we ever saw this. <sighs> Well, you might be also right. apparently it's know. the pit bull that's uh, voiced by michael j fox oh film, okay which, which makes way more sense now that i think about it does it i don't know yeah it was, it was chance and he had kind of like a, a happy-go-lucky like uh younger vibe to him which is definitely what i can uh, hear in, well in that yeah. you know what in that case knowing that um i'm gonna i'm gonna change my 38 to a, a 37 wow <laughs> can i tell you something I'm having I'm I'm locking in my guesses, but I do believe that on Sunday I googled like best movies to watch on Disney Plus because yeah. that's what I use on the bike. I feel like Homeward Bound might actually have a hundred. <laughs> it might be like <laughs> the, it was like all the animated movies from like 1935 to 1965, and then I was yeah. like, really Homeward Bound? But maybe that was a maybe that was an apparition. You you came. So very close yet again with a 71 for the audience score. Oh, almost baby. dead on once more. So that'll be another point for you. Uh, you'll be surprised to learn critics consider Homeward Bound a, a, a masterpiece of cinema. cinema. Oh, my God. 87 percent. Holy on the cow. Tomato meter. Now, can you just for peace of mind, can yeah. you look up Homeward Bound 2 Lost in San Francisco? Absolutely. Uh, give me a guess, real quick. Thirty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fifty-six. Yeah. Okay. They there, yeah. they can recapture that magic twice. A lot more importantly, forty-four in the audience score. They they were oh, not. Okay. They were not here for it. That's the one where they went woke. How about uh, Happy Gilmore? Ooh, I like it. I think we can sense a theme here. It's like movies that we know are certified classics of our generation but may not necessarily have had uh, the audience and critics scores reflecting that opinion. Exactly. Happy uh, I've seen this. I've seen Happy Gilmore. It's a good uh, movie. I, I so spoiled I myself a little bit. I just saw that it won an MTV Movie Award for Best Fight. Oh, so well, I've got to go ahead and put the uh, critics score at 100 in that case. <laughs> 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 I'm wondering, like, when was this in the, in the Adam Sandler arc? This was... Well, this is the beginning. This is the very beginning of the Sandler arc because this is the one that named his production company, right? So he wasn't even really like Adam Sandler yet, was he? What was I, the first big like Adam Sandler movie? So Billy Madison was first. Yeah. 
And then I think this was kind of like if Billy Madison was um, was his hereditary, this was like his midsummer. It was like his nuts <laughs> on the table. Let's see if it, if it was a fluke or if he's got the if he's got the secret sauce. A thousand percent, the first time that comparison's ever been made, but does seem uh, reasonable. It makes accurate. sense, right? Yeah, no, it checks out. I think this is this has got to be like low seventies because I think there's a lot of Sandler hate. Whether or not that's yes. warranted. I think there's a lot of Sandler hate out there. A lot of people just not happy to see a regular looking dude succeed so wildly or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Let's go with like a 73 from audience the, from score. From the audience. Okay. Yeah, Understandable. Yeah. And critics, I think, is going to be just a touch higher than that. Let's go with like a 76 critics. Okay. It's a tough one for me. Because I think that in our... Well, maybe our generation a little bit, but if you're Gen X, I bet if you asked 10 uncles at a cookout that were between <laughs> we the ages of... 10 uncles at a cookout. <laughs> if you said, if they're all between the ages of 40 and 50, and you said, what's your favorite comedy? I think you would get at least one Happy Gilmore in the average I group. I think that's a fair There'd assessment. There'd be some Happy Gilmores, some Dumb and Dumbers. Mm -hmm. Some dude with uh, really big circular glasses would hit you with like duck soup or some Hal Ashby the stuff from like 1928. But most people would say like maybe Step Brothers, Happy Gilmore, Dumb and Dumber, Blazing Saddles, Tommy Boy, something in there. So when I'm trying to. The nation of Fredonia goes bankrupt. It's wealthy. D don't benefactor. don't worry about duck soup, okay? <laughs> people will try to tell you it's worth your time. It's not worth your time. <laughs> A guy is, is 91 years old. What the fuck? It is, it is old and not very good. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know. It might be the best comedy ever made. Um, I don't like it, though. Ask Rotten Tomatoes. It's, guys, I bet it's 100. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I think there's a lot of Sandler haters. Yeah. I think as time has gone on, the Sandler haters have assented to the knowledge that he still has one to two heaters in his comedy collection, and this well, is doubtlessly one of them. They saw Uncut Gems, and then they were like, oh, That's, okay, I of course. He's... I think even Sandler haters, they could rant about how much they hate Adam Sandler for like 20 minutes, but then if you ask them about Happy Gilmore, they'd be like, all right, that's the exception. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up at a 79. Okay. The critics That's audience? Yeah. For yeah. audience, yeah, yeah. And for critics, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it down a bit. You're at a seventy six. Yep. I'm gonna say they got it at I, I think when it came out, they had it at a forty one. And then as Ooh. time has gone on, it has elevated itself into fresh territory at a sixty three with the benefit of hindsight. Happy Gilmore. God. Damn it. You're so fast at looking at <laughs> I know, up. I can't help but get out of here because I got to know and I get <laughs> disappointed every time. So it is a 62 on the tomato meter. Yep, yep. That's low. That's 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 yeah, lower than it should be. You know, they're still working off. It's the long tail right. effect. It's like you of said. The, it's like, yeah, they're, they're trying to recover from a pretty devastating opening. And then a 79. Oh, I had 79. It's an 85 on the audience score. Yeah, so that's yours too. Oh, boy, man, this was, I mean, it, it looked a lot better when it was like five to one, but now 15 to five. That's starting, oh, to, no. seem, <laughs> starting to seem insurmountable. Uh, another one of my all time favorites that I'm very curious, actually, to see the uh, critical reception for is My Cousin Vinny. OK, now this I have seen it before. It's on my Disney Plus watch list for reappraisal. My understanding of my cousin Vinny is that it's an unassailable classic of, of the 1980s so i'm gonna say i'm gonna say critics wise i honestly think that my cousin Vinny is i'm gonna give it a, a 95 i'm gonna Ooh. i'm gonna make you make the high low choice on that okay one. okay and then audience score i think the audience is is full of haters i think that 80% of people who watch a movie these days uh, do it while scrolling through their phone at the same time and then just that's, come up that's with me, their... That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I will say I have a newfound appreciation for cinema 
sitting my ass down on the bike and pedaling for two hours to the movie. You, you get so distracted by the movie, you focus on every detail. You see resonance and the building of themes and you have more appreciation for like characterization and stuff like that. Dude, cardio cinema. When I was uh, going hard at the gym, that was that was my bag. That was, cardio and I cinema. have the exact same opinion. Yeah, well, they just like, go into a dark room when there's a big projector screen. You got a bunch of like ellipticals and treadmills and stuff in there. That's a great business idea when interest rates come down. A movie theater with treadmills and exercise bikes. Yeah. I honestly, okay. I don't know why. You said I mean, like, yeah, but your your heart said well, no. Like, the thing is, is it exists. <laughs> like, I don't no, know. no, those are gyms with TVs. Okay, <laughs> this is going to be a movie theater with bikes <laughs> just, and treadmills. Just changing the name. <laughs> no, it's the ratio of the screen size to the oh, amount of. <laughs> okay. All right, yeah, yeah. Fucking, there's an element of gamesmanship. Uh, I want to stay high with it, man, but I know I gotta, I gotta take this window here. I'm gonna go with an 82 on the critics. On the critics, audience. Remind me, you went, you went like six. I went with 82 on that. Oh no, no, you went 82 audience, right? Okay, that's probably where I got it from. Um, jeez, oh, I do think the audience really liked this one as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go 87. 87, okay. 87 audience. I think this one was. Maybe one of the higher ratings overall. We'll see. I'll be disappointed, honestly, if this isn't one of the highest rated ones that we see today. I have good news. Okay. I am not disappointed. Hey! But the bad news is I think I might have still somehow lost the critics. <laughs> What's the critic score? Uh, oh, no, never mind. Okay, I think I'm good. The critics was at 87. What? Which, damn. They like, put out a hit on my cousin Vinny. I mean, that, well, you're disappointed? Well, because I said 95. <laughs> oh, true, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's up there, man. That's pretty damn good. My conspiracy theory about Rotten Tomatoes, if you look at the percentage of movies that are fresh versus rotten, in the year 2000, it was like 50-50. And now, in 2023, 2024, it's like 80% of movies are fresh. Right. So well, I... Look at this, and I know how Rotten Tomatoes works, and it's more like, did you like it or not like it? And then they take mm -hmm. the, the aggregate. Yeah. I feel like an, an 87 for My Cousin Vinny is like that's sacrilegious. 13% of, of critics said, nah, bro, give me Homeward Bound instead. <laughs> I don't know about that. Like, I don't disagree. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm very biased about this one, but I, I mean, of, of all the... Of all the possible bars to set as far as what we've discussed today, this definitely feels like where we should be. At least it's in. it's high. I can't I guess yeah, I can't no, argue with that. Uh, but but certainly could be higher. Eighty seven for the audience score as well. I Holy guess I nailed that one, so that feels on. good. I feel like I'm gonna have to search this after the fact, but I, w I do wonder what their actual top highest rated movies are. I'm sure you've probably seen that list once or twice. I remember that for like ten years it used to be Toy Story Two. That's fair. And then no, one I, dude was I'm like, okay with that. Mm, actually, it's mid. <laughs> I gotta meet that guy, dude. He's probably got a YouTube channel with like 8 million subscribers. <laughs> I'm gonna take you to Big Trouble in Little China. Wow. Okay, this is, uh, this is left. This, this is not even left field for me. This is in a different ballpark, dude. Unknown. Big you, Trouble. You, you don't know much about it. Not much at all. Poster alone is definitely working for me. You can show this off real quick. Jack Burton's in for some serious trouble, and you're in for some serious fun. Absolutely horrendous tagline. Um, oh, yeah. That one. Well, I mean, uh, this is at least Kurt Russell's uh, mullet certainly does a lot of heavy lifting here. Truck driver Jack Burton wins a bet with his friend Wang Chi. To make sure he follows through on payment, he accompanies him to the airport to pick up his Chinese fiance, where a Chinese-American street gang, the Lords of Death, try to kidnap another Chinese girl. It's a case of mistaken crazy. identity. Yeah, yeah. I was just looking at how many times they say the word Chinese in the first two paragraphs. I, I was of feeling <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. They were like, this guy's Chinese. He's marrying well, a way, Chinese lady. China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they then tracked down the Lords of Death to Chinatown, by the way, where they battled two ancient Chinese warrior societies. This is turning vaguely Trump. <laughs> vaguely. Chinatown. Chinatown. Like... <laughs> 
Olivia Munn, Kim Cattrall, Samantha, Samantha from Sex in the City people. I always thought of myself more as a Miranda, really, the red hair, of course. Um, you're doing the fingers, right? When yes, the hands. Well. I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The bad part is I've started to do the hands in real life when I talk as well. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the voice. Oh, people, God. we do do the voice. Can and then people say, is quick? that Trump? And I say, it is, people. Many people say that it is. Uh, I, I just give me one or two Chiblis. I just need to hear Chibli. Chibli. Chibli, the Antifa. Chibli, the lieutenant of Antifa. <laughs> the woke mob, mafia, mama, Chibli. Although this is a cult classic, I'm going to say some normies will watch it and be like, I don't get it. It's a little silly. So I'm going to yeah. give us some wiggle room. I'm going to take the audience down to 72. Okay. Um, and you know what? I want to put it. I want to put it at seventy two, seventy two. But I, I'm going to pull it down a little bit. I'm going to take it, to, and not for the meme. This is a, a serious matter. I'm going to yeah. take it to sixty nine critics, seventy two audience. Big Trouble in Little China has a seventy four from the critics. Right, which remind I, I, all the numbers are mixing you, up in my mind. You had the you're I at eighty, 80 and I'm yeah. at sixty nine, which means oh, I take that by God. one. <laughs> But then the and audience... So many like that. The audience gave you an 82. So right. you're at I 78, think, you get that yeah. one. There we go. Okay, I'll take another split. Big respect to the audience. Uh, that's, we're getting there. We're crawling our way back up. This critic's consensus in 1986, I'm sure it said, a big waste of your time. Don't go yeah. see this. Now it says, brimming with energy and packed with humor. Big trouble in Little China distills Kung Fu B-movies as affectionately as it subverts them. 1986, they were like, fresh. you're stupid if you go see this. You're dumb. <laughs> How do you feel about uh, uh, Tom Hanks' Big? I don't really like Tom Hanks. Man. I like, I, it's, you know what it up? is? I'm letting myself, I'm letting my feelings on Forrest Gump taint how I feel about his entire filmography, which is probably yeah. not fair. Yeah, I do think I mean, he's I, a great. I'm surprised actor. you don't like Forrest Gump either. I think Forrest Gump is it's like the it, Bon Jovi of movies, which is to that, say overrated, and people are shocked when you say you don't like it. Yeah, and I'm yeah, like, but it's but it's bad. What's the best Tom Hanks movie? I mean, Saving Private Ryan is really good. Oh yeah, okay, that's, that's fair. a great movie. Mm -hmm. And the rest, I mean, Apollo 13 is an amazing movie. Yeah, it's pretty good. He's got some pretty damn good movies, man. Like Philadelphia. Yeah. I haven't seen What's it, but I it's it's, it's quality. The, that's the boxing I movie, do, right? I I even like uh What's the one where he's is, the, is it just literally called the terminal? Or what's the one where he's in the airport? Yeah, yeah. He, Krakosia, the terminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that I mean that, that's a pretty good shit. movie too. Eat shit. I forgot about catch me if you can too. Yeah. That's oh, good it's one. another good one. It's crazy that dude made the whole thing up. Like well, he, honestly, he lied about impressive. being a liar. It's crazy. Yeah, it's just no, one more like, grift. That is remarkable. Like I, the, the, we, he won us all over by virtue of being like uh, remarkably shitty. I think that this is going to be in the same range as my cousin Vinny audience score. I'm going to give it what you gave my cousin Vinny. I'm going to give it an 87. Nice. That is wow. Okay, a 92, 87. America so, loves Tom Hanks. Hanks. Yeah, if Tom no, Hanks ran for president, they would get rid of the constitutional amendment that put term limits <laughs> in. He would be president until he wanted to leave. <laughs> he has cross aisle appeal. Do you remember when he got COVID? It felt like that was it. He he got COVID, and Rudy Gobert touched the microphones, and the NBA shut down. That was all in right. like a twenty four hour period. Right. When it Tom like Hanks it felt got like we COVID, were warning him already. I know we were like, this dude is cooked, man. Yeah. It is pretty clearly implied, if not outright shown, that uh, the the uh, the female lead, whose name I'm forgetting in this uh, movie, uh, uh, essentially uh, becomes a pedophile. Yes. So I haven't seen it, but that is one of two things I know about I it. The other one is the big piano. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two things anyone remembers about big. Um. I don't think that really factored into anything uh, as far as the critical reception goes. Though. No, back exactly in the day, they were like, probably like, that's just par for the course. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, whoa, that's weird. We probably didn't even register. Um, 
Because it's kind of like, isn't it? I haven't seen it. Is it a love story? Kind of. I mean, like, I think the the the, the point of the movie, if if there is one, I think is to be like, you know, like don't you, you don't take for granted what you got as a, as a kid or an adult, you know. Okay. Like, there's, there's advantages to both, but there's also like a weird uh, romance going on where he, you know, he's he's a child, he's a thirteen year old in a in an adult body, but I think she even like finds that out. Oh, that's got to be hard for her for to sure. live with. You can't just go live a normal life after you found yeah, out that, that you did that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Is she okay? I don't think so. I think she dies at the end. What? No, I'm no, I don't know. no shot, bro. Wow. Holy cow. That is. We have a new uh, front runner for highest ranked film. I knew it. 98. 98. 98. Wow, that is uh, that is startling. Uh, that's the critics, and then the audience score eighty two. Eighty. Well, you got the audience score on that. Got one, the audience for sure. score. You're splitting that one again, but uh, I, I'm just kind of floored. Like, holy shit! I'm gonna say um, the nineteen ninety eight science fiction movie based on the TV show Lost in Space. Whoa, that is another. I I've not even heard of this one. Starring Gary Oldman and Matthew LeBlanc, aka Ooh. Joey from Friends. And then it just says Danger Will Robinson. That's this movie? That's this movie, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That gives me a different frame of reference here. Yeah, sorry, Chad. I can't find one that's bigger than like 180 by 300 for the this. Is, it did come out uh, like 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna save you from yourself a little bit, please. Because this movie did not originate the line. The line is oh. from the TV show from like the 1960s. Okay, so that's yeah, that does change things a bit. No lasting legacy. The 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 entirety of the production seems pretty forgettable. Let's go with like a 55 critics reception here, something along those lines, and then. This does kind of feel like a movie that might have a few people going to bat for it. So I'm going to go a little higher on the audience. I'm going to go with like a 67. Having lived through this, I have a scar of, of, for this movie as well. I'm going to spoil it because it's not very good. Okay. Um, Gary Oldman plays Dr. Smith or whatever his name is. He gets halfway through the movie. He gets bit by an alien creature, like a bug. Um, okay. And he goes, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. And then... They kind of like time travel and you figure out that Gary Oldman, he actually is now transformed into like an alien bug. And it's so scary. Like when I was a, when I was 10, I got nightmares watching yeah, this. Yeah, in the back seat of the car for that exactly. one. Exactly. But the word, no, the worst part is I watched it on our 19 inch TV and it still scared me. That's how you know. <laughs> That's like what we had. We were rocking one of those with like the built in VCR. Oh yeah, yeah. God. So, like, when we were moving like state to state uh, for the military days, we would always have like the, the van set up with the family where we had like a blanket uh, draped between the middle and the back seat. Of course. So, we had yeah. like a little makeshift movie theater with the, uh, with the 17 inch VCR TV combo propped up on the blanket. So, it was Dude, that's kind of sick. It was pretty good. Yeah. We had honestly like the, the, the difficulty of cross country moving multiple times as children was kind of uh, outweighed by the good memories that we created with, with like the road trips and like swimming in hotel pools and stuff like that. I'm going to go crazy. I think this has an eight on Rotten Whoa, Tomatoes, like from the God critics. Damn. Okay. Okay. But I definitely, I, I think it's going to be, rev I, I'm going to take it a step. I'm going to take it down to five. That's wow. And there's no games reason why I would do that. I just I'm going nuts on the table. I think so this confident. is yeah, reviled okay. by by critics. My goodness. Now I think this is one of those situations where the audience is going to like it more. But I certainly I wouldn't put it in the as a red tomato. I think it's going to be firmly in green splat territory. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm starting to feel bad about my 67. I'm going to give it a 41. I'm going to go five and 41. 27% from the critics. Boy, so you still got it. I did. Five. Turns out five <laughs> is still incredible. closer. <laughs> and a 24, rare, can I say rare audience uh, dub? Because this yeah. movie is trash, but they trashed it even more than the critics trashed it. Yeah, man, goddamn. 
Oh, boy. Speaking of being shameless, how about a little Robin Hood men in tights? Robin Hood. What's your experience with Robin Hood men in tights? This is the parody, the satire. 100%. Okay. I remember that my parents rented this from the video store, and I watched it, but I do not recall uh, anything about it, and I don't believe I've seen it since. You know what's funny? So. I, as a kid, I never realized that this poster was like satirical. Like right. it, I just thought, like, wow, he must be really good. He's firing like He's just a bunch a badass, of arrows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he looks pretty confident about it. My He's parents like, I mean, went crazy for this. So I think right after Robin Hood Men in Tights, he made a movie with Leslie Nielsen called Dracula Dead and Loving It. And I remember watching that with my parents and my grandparents, and all four of them like died laughing. Yeah, yeah, then I, yeah. as an adult, I like looked it up on Rotten Tomatoes. The shit has like a two out of one hundred. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I thought Leslie Nelson at least would be. It's like, it's like a fifty point boost. He's on the he's really funny, but he has been in a lot of garbage. Can I? Yeah. I, need, I need your phone a friend on this one. He also did a movie that takes place on like. Um, an intergalactic cruise that came out maybe 2001, 2002 that was insanely garbage. And my parents rented it from the video store and they died laughing again. <laughs> I love that. But I can't remember the name at all. Okay. He did, yeah, he did fucking Naked Gun, Airplane, Police Squad. 2001, A Space Travesty. That's it. Oh, man, that's good. <laughs> I like that. All right. I'm going to say critics gave it a 64. Sometimes okay. when, when satire hits, it can get into the 100s, but sometimes it's, it's hit or miss. Yeah. And then for the audience, I'm going to say that this is a, a likable movie. It's, it's easy to laugh alongside of. I'm going to give it a 73 for the audience. I think I'm going to go a little higher either way. I want to go with a 71? 71 critics from the critics. 71 okay. critics. I think this I think this is something the audience is even today are likely scoring fairly high. Mm. I'm trying to remember like there's not really anything all that problematic either, especially for a movie that came out about this time and to be like a parody movie. It's it's pretty tame. Robin it overall. continues to get more based in in the modern sense. Exactly. So, I'm going to go with like a 79. Wow. This was a critical failure. 42. 42? On the tomato meter for this one. Okay, I'm after this, look up Dracula Dead and Loving It. All right, yeah, but uh, <laughs> let's, uh, I think we're splitting again on this one. I think you got the critics. Uh, 81. 81 from the, for the audience. audience. You were like, we were very close. Very close, yeah. I'll take another split there. Okay, so it was a space travesty, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That should be yeah. like a 3% from the critics. I'm going to yeah. say 21% from the audience. Uh, no critical rating. <laughs> it's got three reviews. It's a Canadian classic. And uh, 17. That's Audience really... Score. You know yeah, how bad a movie has to be for 17% of that's people to like it? fucking low. There's 10,000 <laughs> ratings, dude. There's a lot of people. This movie went Let's crazy in Scarborough, man. You know what? Let's go, let's go with something in that vein. The number one movie to test out your uncle's Dolby Digital 5.1 surround sound system he put in his home theater. Can mm. can you guess what it is? Highlander? You have a cool ass uncle. <laughs> Cuz I was thinking of Gladiator. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah. You my, just got me in that ballpark. My uncle doesn't sure. know shit about Highlander. Yeah, mine mine died. Well, <laughs> oh, inspired by Daniel P. Mannix's 1958 book Those About to Die. Yeah, subsequently Absolutely. titled The Way of the Gladiator. That's how that you know your sense, movie yeah. made an impact. This bro went <laughs> yeah, back the name of the 40 years book. later. He's like, this book's <laughs> actually called Gladiator. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. This has got to be out there. I would be shocked if this was not at least 80 plus. Ridley Scott keeps chasing the dragon. Once every three yeah. movies, he's like, it's Gladiator again. <laughs> What has he put out since then? Dude, The Last Duel is really, really good. Really? It is two hours and 30 minutes long. So it's... That's the... Uh, it's a long one. That's the uh, Matt Damon one, right? It's Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. Neither of them talk in a Boston accent. Oh, come on. It's, it's Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, and Adam Driver. 
And it's oh, a little, wow. it's a little like you see the same events from multiple perspectives and in seeing it each time it illuminates something different about the okay. event, but also okay. raises the ambiguity about the event. Yeah, that does sound pretty good. Here's what I think. Here's my understanding of Gladiator as someone who's seen it many times. When it came out, best movie ever made. Yeah. That held for six, seven years. Then people started to be like, actually, it's not quite historically. We, everyone became a realism Andy for a while. Yeah. Gladiators didn't actually fight like that. And actually, many of the gladiators didn't live in prison. They all got to live as celebrities. And then, and why weren't they naked? I want to see Russell Crowe's dong. <laughs> well, that, be that as it may. Um, I, I think as time has gone on, we've gotten out of the valley. And people are like, this is true cinema again. Can I also say, just reading... Back, dude. Reading this synopsis, I'm losing my mind. It's the second highest grossing film of 2000 behind Mission Impossible 2? Oh, oh my oh God. <laughs> what? That's Cruz, dude. The only the bad one? I mean, oh. it's still like he, he put out the Top Gun and made like a billion dollars a couple years ago, ago, didn't it? Yeah, yeah it did he make a lot of money. still got it, man. I'm going to take an, a flat 80 for Gladiator. Okay, okay. In that's my, right. that's in about my, where you gotta go, I think, for the gamesmanship element. That's what they, I would. I think it's gonna be eighty four, but yeah. I'm not gonna play eighty five. It just makes you like a scumbag. If this was the Price Is Right and there was a dining set on the line, then yeah, yeah, I'm going one dollar over. But and then and the you critics can tell looking at me that I need that dining set. <laughs> I always wonder who's on the Price is Right, and they're like, oh, sick, I don't have a bed and a dresser. Like, wouldn't <laughs> that just be I'm, annoying? I'm You're glad like, to have an extra now. <laughs> Like, I won the prize, and now I got to, like, sell my old furniture, unbox yeah, the new stuff, and build it? Like, exactly. That's no fun, man. Mm -hmm. Like, a car, I mean, at least you can, you know, you can hawk it, but... Well, the, the thing about the car is they get fucked on taxes, right? Like, yeah, you probably end up paying more for the taxes on the car than you make from it. It's true, and it's never, like... You know, even uh, like a Honda Civic, it's always like a, a two door rear wheel drive manual Chevy Spark. <laughs> and then <laughs> you're they're like just trying to get rid of like in my head, I'm like a car is at least twenty thousand dollars. And then it turns out that son of a bitch is like thirteen thousand eight hundred and sixty two dollars. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, my cents. God, yeah. you're so fucking good at this. And I don't know why I'm surprised. Holy, <laughs> I am. <laughs> it's insane. Dude. So seventy nine <laughs> from the critics. And an you're, 87 from the audience. You're a grand total of three percentage points away from nailing it for both. That is, that is outrageous. Do you happen to know? I, I feel like this might be one that you actually just like looked up out of curiosity. Do you happen to know the Rotten Tomato score for the Five Nights at Freddy's movie? No. Uh, okay, good. Let's do that. <laughs> um, but I can, I can hazard a guess. I, I would hope you would, yeah. I think this is a great choice. I think you've cho chosen a, a very interesting one to discuss. Because my so hunch too. is that, first off, I do know that this made, it became Blumhouse's highest grossing yes. uh, movie theatrically. Wildly successful, yeah. Which is crazy. I can't shake the feeling that critics would not know what to do with this, irrespective yeah. of the quality of the film. Yeah. I'm going to say I, the audience is the crazy part. I think the audience is going to be much higher than the critics. But I, I don't agree. think it's going to be like in the 70s. So I'm going to I'm going to go audience. People are going to be surprised by this one. I'm going to say 56. I don't think it crosses into red tomato. Okay. And I think it's going to be from the critics. I'm going to go 20 I, I can't bring myself to do 28. I'm going to do 27. 27 critics, 56 audience. <laughs> <Where's> the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I actually, I, I can't fight the feeling that this is like the audience score is going to blow us away. Like, I, th I think that I think there's going to be a, a large Five Nights fan base. 80 plus. Yes. Or like I'm, I'm going to I'm going to go 76. 76 for the audience okay. score. I do, I do think that it's going to like absolutely shock us how high that audience score is. I think you're in the ballpark with critics. I I can't imagine this being over a 50. I would be shocked by that as well. Let's go with like a 42. 
42. 42 critics. I love that neither of us have seen it, right? No, absolutely So we, we talked about Gladiator for like 11 minutes. Yeah. Five Nights at Freddy's were like, just send it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am vindicated. Oh, okay. Audience score, 87. That shit is fraudulent. Insane. You can take your that point. That's fraudulent. I want to see verifiable. I, I want to see seen. IP address audits <laughs> for all of the voters. I, want, I don't want to see any duplicated IP addresses. That is nuts. I want to see a piece of photo identification from everybody that voted. <laughs> Remind me your critical score. 27. 27. You got me there. It's a 32. 32. On the tomato meter. Yeah. Not a big surprise on that one, but that audience score, yeah. I, I, I was pretty ready to be floored by that. 87. It was nutty. Forgive me. I'm not trying to diminish the fact that you had your finger on the pulse. Is it possible that 20% of those reviews are ironic tens? You I know would, how I people would leave say like. It's not even possible, but likely, yeah. It's like, you know how Steam reviews with like 10,000 hours? They give it a thumbs down and go like, it's not very good. Or they'll review like a calculator app and be like, thumbs down, no sex. This movie has everything for the fans of this beloved worldwide phenomenon of a video game franchise. When we watched this movie opening night, the crowd was insane to be from <laughs> beginning to the very, very end credits scene. Yo, what about the movie, bro? I think this is the best video game movie of 2023. I think that's correct. Like, I, th they're not wrong in that assessment. Well, uh, people like the Super Mario Brothers movie. I haven't seen oh, it myself, okay, true. Though. Yeah, they actually do have some valid competition <laughs> from that year. It made $300 million, which is that's pretty... That's fucking crazy. That is insane, <laughs> man. It had a $20 million budget, too. That's like... I thought it'd be Holy a higher cow. budget than that, at least. Good God. All right, there you go. Five Nights at Freddy's. I, uh, I literally thought it was just about a puppet that goes insane. There's a whole lore here. There's a, a guy, the guy who made the puppets put trap some people's souls in the, in the puppets or something. Got some saw shit. What the hell? And it is like one of them is based on like his late wife or something like that. There was a, a fire at a birthday party 30 years ago. It's, it is violent. Holy shit. That's all I know. Take I like back. that you're we're we're kind of like on a spectrum here. You're bringing us back in like the I'll 80s say. and 90s, and I keep bringing us back to the modern. <laughs> well, I'm going to split the difference on this one. How about okay. School of Rock? Oh, I love it, dude. Still happy to sit down and watch this in its entirety any day. Great, mo great movie. I mean this as a compliment. You strike me as a Jack Black enjoyer. I love Jack Black. Me too. He's a. I mean. I haven't really ever like gone out of my way to consume his stuff, but everything that I've ever seen of him, I love. Like, like including like his YouTube channel, for God's sake. Like, he's just a, he's such a fun presence. How do you not like Jack Black? He's That's great. Precisely my thoughts. You know what I just noticed? I never realized until you know looking at it now, the poster is meant to look like a Rolling Stone magazine cover. Oh well, yeah, 100%. that's a nice little nod. I, as a kid, I never noticed that. Not a lot to hate about this one, right? Like, I'm like, like, we've had like the Sandler hate. We've had the Hanks hate, which is, you know, like rational or not is <laughs> is a factor. I don't think that I don't think Jack Black has the same kind of detractors. You know, I think that society tried to hate Jack Black in the same way that they did to Jim Carrey, but it didn't take. I think yeah, he no. he he tanked it and shrugged it off. Let's go with like an, uh, you know, actually, I'm not, my. Uh, the the evil realistic part of my brain is bringing me back down here and i think actually that this critic score is going to be a little lower let's give it like a 73 73 critics 87 audience i think your audience score is bang on i think there's not a lot to to gain there i actually i'm going to take it a step higher on the critics okay i think this is one of the most likable it's a rotten tomatoes classic because it might not be anybody's... Well, maybe it might be some people's favorite movie. But Anybody favorite movie, School of Rock? Hands up. I bet there's a few. But it's, it's a hard movie to dislike. I, yeah. I, I have a hard time seeing anybody with a, with a soul watching this and going, ah, that wasn't a good use of my time. So I'm going to take it up to... I'm going to go into 89 on the critics. And on the audience, I really feel like you're on, on an 87. You're in a good spot. 
you gonna go higher? You know what? I'm I'm gonna play high low with you. I'm gonna drop an eighty eight on it. I mean, if Five Nights at Freddy's was an eighty seven, this should be about one hundred and thirty two. So I agree. Yeah, that that mathematically checks out to me. What what did I miss? Okay, School of Rock, ninety two on the critic score. Wow, I love that. That is shocking, but that's fantastic. You're not ready for this. I don't know if I can be the bearer of bad news. Don't tell me. First off, it's, you, it's, you get the below, point. You get the below point. Below eighty? It's, I do get the point. Okay, that's good. It's below eighty. We'll it's below seventy-five. What the fuck? It's below seventy. Don't stop this. It's below sixty-five. You have to stop doing this. This is causing me physical pain. It's sixty-four. What the fuck is wrong with people? How do? You, how does this happen? I don't think that this website can be relied on as, as like a uh, an accurate aggregation anymore. What the hell happened? One second here. I'm, Who, I'm who's scrolling. responsible for this? Who do I have to write an angry letter to? I'm scrolling down to the user reviews. This has got 250,000 ratings. <laughs> this, this, this is the angriest I've been today by far. This is not acceptable. Don't get Every me started. review I'm reading is like four or five stars. Like, yeah, it's great. I love it. Marisol was cooking. What did Marisol say? I'm genuinely baffled as to why School rock. of Rock is so well received. Linklater's tribute vehicle to a beloved genre plays like a B-rate effort that Disney dusted off, patched together, and pushed out in the wake of Freaky Friday's punkish success. What do you go back no. to university, no. Point Dexter? Get out of here with that absolute you nonsense. Nerd, nerd alert. Do me a quick favor and go, uh, Google Joey Gatos Jr., by the way, who was the uh, lead guitarist in that movie, and look at what he looks like now and uh, be pleasantly surprised. Joey? Because he has, he has become Jr. his character, as far as I can tell. Yep. Yeah, I can see that. I'm a big fan of his look now. He looks... <laughs> this is the dumbest thing to say about a person. It's like he looks the same, but older. <laughs> He looks like yeah. he looks like the kid version Maybe of himself like if he became an adult. Joey was born on stuff. April right, 18th. Up. Oh, did I did I delete uh, myself? This will be my last one. I think I did. Worth 10 points a piece. Hang on, hang on. I got to I got to say this, man. This is so good. Yeah. Joey Gatos Jr. was born April 18th, 1991. He started playing the guitar at the age of three, but didn't really get in touch with it until he was about eight years old or so. Lazy! Yeah, dude, dude I mean... Took the dude five years to get in touch with the guitar? Come on, just bro. Just get all the breaks, huh? All right. <laughs> mm, I oh, think you know I what, actually? I have, this, I have this in my list. And this was also just recommended in chat, so this does feel like a good way to close out here. Okay. Uh, let's go with uh, Johnny Knoxville's The Ringer. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. You're going to get me in trouble because this, this is a my conversation, favorite dude. movie ever. It is? <laughs> no, what? Oh, no, I love it's that. not. It's not. Oh. Um, I was going to be so excited about that conversation. So this is the movie where uh, Johnny Knoxville pretends to qualify for the Special Olympics so he can win some easy money. He, he owes, or sorry, no, his uncle Gary owes $40,000 in gambling debts okay. and suggests that they fix the Special Olympics in order to solve both of their financial problems. It, irrespective of everything else, how yeah. crazy is it that Johnny Knoxville had and continues to have like some crossover success as an actor? I don't get how it happened. The dude was like taking shots to the testicles with a paintball gun and yeah. hollywood said i need that guy to be like the lead actor in this like, movie when, was the, when did the switch take place because it was like a direct transition I, his first film role as far as i can tell was in men in black 2 okay yeah. which is remarkable in and of itself is he the guy who gets his head blown off and then it grows back or is that i'm thinking think of tony shell isn't it no, is he, he is the wait. Okay, he oh Johnny Knoxville's the guy with two heads. I knew it was something uh, head related with this guy. Okay, okay. He'd only really had like bit roles. Yeah, I think this was his first grandpa. lead role, right? Well, he's the oh, lead yeah. in Dukes of Hazard, but the movie shouldn't exist. Right. But he acts circles around Jessica Simpson. I mean, he's top billing in Dukes of Hazard. I mean, it's him and Sean William Scott and uh, yeah, uh, okay. and <laughs> Jessica <laughs> Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> just top billing by default. <laughs> um, I mean, okay, so I do think that this movie was a success. 
I don't. I, I doubt that the the critical response was very favorable, but I, I do. Th- I, I think it did well. Like it was talked about. It was people. People liked it. I think, but I, I, I'm pretty sure the critical. Here, give give me the disadvantage because you suggested the movie. Okay. I'll I'll go first. Yeah, and I'm willing to say that the critics. I bet they did not vibe with this. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it at a at a 32. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to think that the audience, this whole Five Nights at Freddy's thing has... Uh, it's really thrown a stick in the fucking gears, <laughs> it's man. It's thrown my That's compass sure. <laughs> all. It's spinning around. It's going to have a 70 even from the audience. I'm going 32-70. 32-70, okay. I'm going to go for a uh, possibly baffling move here, but I'm going to say that the critics' response to this was not bad. It's not good, but I don't think it was bad. I think it was like a 55. This is probably like critics. the only movie where people would say, like, you can't make movies like this anymore, but it's actually yeah. true. Right. Yeah. No, like, you can't release this today. Someone would blow say. up your house. Absolutely. Uh, audience, you went 70, right? 70 from the audience, yeah. I'll hit you with a 60. Okay. 60 okay. audience, pretty, pretty close. 60 audience. Keep in mind, these are worth 10 points each, of course. Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's only fair. A 40 on from the, the tomato meter. From the critics, okay. From the critics, so I guess it's still out of reach for me. That's but the audience know. score is worth 20 points. as Right. <laughs> They're 21. <laughs> hey, and the audience score is 68. Well, wow. okay. Well, unfortunately, did I say 20? I'm in negative yeah, 20. Negative 20, right. Yeah, so that does put you at a, at a, at a resounding uh, nine, which means at the end of the day here, I did end up winning. Wow, look at me go. Mm. All right. <laughs> a fun, even fight. I'll think not. Okay. You, you, Steve, you got a- Steve reluctantly enters the Special Olympics under the guise of being a high functioning young man named Jeffy Dahmer. <laughs> <laughs> this movie has come true. No, it hasn't. (laughs) (laughs) This has never happened. (laughs) Oh, man. Final score, Bear 12, Northern Lion 26. Bear clap. Well done. Well done. Good game. Good game. Shouldn't be surprised. Uh, The competitive side of me was hoping we'd make it like a little more respectable, but you didn't you didn't run away with it at the end. That was fun, man. I enjoyed that. I I loved this. Uh, Now I have a a piece of paper as a keepsake as well with all of our scores written down. That's adorable. It actually looks like like a degenerate gambler sheet from uh, like a horse racing track. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Good good stuff. stuff. Good stuff. All right. Take it easy, man. You as well. See you later. Thank you to Bear for, for setting it up, by the way. Let me also say, with God as my witness, I was not joking. I, from 2002 until probably 2010, back when websites existed instead of just platforms, Rotten Tomatoes was one of like five websites I went to, I would say on average, probably one time per day. So I, some of these scores, a lot of people are saying, how does NL know these? How does he have his finger on the pulse of Rotten Tomatoes? Because I digested it daily like a, like a multivitamin for a decade when my brain still had neuroplasticity. So I, I have a, a sense, not a perfect sense, but I have a sense for the kind of movies that tend to have done well with critics versus audiences and, and vice versa. Can I ask why? Because, you know, I lived in the suburbs. Like a movie would come out and you'd be like, should I see this? And then most of the time back then, they were like, no. Nowadays, they're like, yeah. And then you watch it and you're like, what the fuck? This isn't that good. Hang on, let me. Oh, Kate is already live. What do you mean? Well, you know, back in my day, something in the 72 on Rotten Tomatoes actually meant something. That meant you would go see it and you would leave the theater and be like, that movie was pretty good. Nowadays, a 72, you're leaving the movie theater and you're going, I didn't hate it. And then, because it's a fucking joke these days, man. Every Marvel film is a 90 plus. Yeah, because they're likable. Are they lovable? Well, they were when we were all psyoped for like six or seven years. <laughs> I'm telling you, I want to see like a plot of time on the X-axis and 
average Rotten Tomato score on the y-axis. I, my toxic conspiracy theory, I believe that the average Rotten Tomatoes score of the median movie is like 11 points higher than it was 20 years ago. Do you feel like movies are 11 points better than they used to be? Well, let's wait to talk about that until we get the facts, but it's because Critic is a wide net now. That's true. I did see somebody say in chat, they're like, when you started reading Rotten Tomatoes, it was all people who were movie reviewers for newspapers, and now it's just angry dudes with a YouTube channel, which is crazy. Is why? Whoa, 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 whoa. hang on. In, here's a stat. In 2009, the average tomato meter score was 46%. And it was at that level for much of the 2000s. By 2019, the average score had climbed up to 62%, an important milestone since 60% is the dividing line between a fresh film and a rotten one. It's 13 points up. So first off, <laughs> egg nose ball. Secondly, well, you know what's, to be fair, the average movie, I, instead of being, I, I hate to be like an old curmudgeon, I feel like the movie industry has gotten worse. I feel like it. there's been good things. There's been like the rise of independent and foreign cinema being much more easily available where I live, at least in North America. I do feel like they produce less Hollywood slappers, especially mid-budget action movies and comedies. But the average movie might actually be 13% better than it was in the year 2000. But the average movie is still pretty bad. <laughs> Back in the day, I was watching a lot of average movies because like only three movies I knew about came out weekly. So you'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll watch fucking The Skeleton Key with Kate Hudson or whatever. Nowadays, 3,000 movies come out a day. So I'm like, the only shit I'm going to watch is Ridley Scott's The Last Duel. Anyway, I'm going to send you over to my wife's stream. Enjoy yourself. And I will be back tomorrow, which is Tuesday. I don't know what we're going to do, but we'll figure it out. Later. I know a girl who has a level two bear. She's always overriding whatever food was there. Don't like garlic, she don't like cheese, she don't like lemon or any of these, she uses scampi for kibu chibu. Honey also works, it would make more sense. Right. What the hell is this? It's early flaming lips. It's, it's, it's boomer. <laughs>